this is our second class being back from the whole uh, control mechanism thing that we've been dealing with. And um, it's been really inspiring to uh, see people come here and get filled with great information and then seeing how it affects the broader community out there it has been very rewarding. Um, to recap last week's class, we had Drake here from Natural Farming Hawaii. And basically the takeaway from that class was, was I'm gonna break down the takeaway real fast because it was super important. He was basically saying you got, you got these uh, neutral microbes here at a 60 percentile in a given environment. You got good guys at a 20 percentile and you got bad guys at a 20 percentile. So this is any given environment. So say you went out to your backyard and, and this is in a decent environment, per, you could say. So th we're talking about microbes. The, and this is just a recap last week. It only takes 5% influence on the 60% of neutral to have it go to either good or bad in your environment. So that means with 5% leadership, so if we get this up to 25% good, then we all of a sudden got 80% good microbes you guys did you guys catch that last week and do you follow what he was trying to say oh, yeah. so this also relates to the human race so we got 60 percent of the human race is just neutral they're just will blowing in the wind willing to go with whatever yeah whatever the leader wants them to do whatever the tv or the politician or the the, the guy in the robe or the guy in the white lab coat wants them to do, they're, they're ready for it because they just want to be told what to do. So all we need to do is have 5%, this is the takeaway, 5% good leadership and we get 80% good people. Isn't that brilliant? That, that made me, that like changed my whole thing because before you feel overburdened, oh I got to get 100% people to be good. We only got to get 5% to do good and we get the majority to follow us. So that's what I like about seeing all these people because because we're already on our way to the 5%, you know. Just imagine in our lives how much we've been told to be the bad side. Every TV commercial you ever watched, every TV show, every movie, every scare tactic, every news information, they're always telling you about the bad. Every rap song you heard, every rock and roll song, they're always saying, you know, come, come to our side. So obviously the 5% have always been going here, so it's leaning 80 to here. So now we're just flipping the script on them, you know? So yeah, that was last week and that was just a little intro, but anyway, we're going to get started on this class. You guys ready? All right, I'm going to do a, a quick uh, Ryan in the building. Seen him earlier. Oh, yeah. Ryan, uh, Carl's here. I didn't see Carl show Carrie. up yet. Uh, Carl's another guy, but yeah, we got Carrie here. Noah's here, Alex is here. Is Justin here yet? Justin's not here. Oh, there's Justin right there. Lisa here? Not yet. Okay, Ola's here, Phil, Jay, Joni, Dave. Um, if I didn't say your name, tell us that you're here. What's your name and, and you guys? Derek. Derek. Mackenzie. Mackenzie. Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. Who else did I not say? Gunner's here. You guys want to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. Julio. And Julio. Edward. Edward's here. Okay. Louisa. What's up, guys? What was your name? Louisa. Louisa. All right. Noel's here. Nice. We got a we got a full house, man. This is awesome. Merlin. Merlin is here. That's right. Merlin's a new face. Merlin's crucial, he's been coming to the shop, getting to know us. He's a good guy, good contribution to the community. All right, let me get to, um, to the right page here. So today is not exactly about KNF, but it, it, all the classes relate to natural farming and natural living. So there's a common theme to all the classes coming to the institute, but um, we're going to compartmentalize it so we can uh, understand things a little deeper. And today is all about food and food choices, about what we choose to put in our body and why natural farming is so important. Okay? 
All right, let me pull up my slideshow. Food presentation. All right, we're gonna get started. Basically, we're an electrical being. Our body is electrical. It, re it goes off electrical impulses. It, that's the driving force of our lives is electricity and magnetism, the only forces in the universe. Last week we talked about the, the um, human biofield and the electrical field that we can sense with different instruments and whatnot. We talked about the heart and the brain actually having readable electrical pulses and so we know we're electrical beings. What is the biggest conduit of electricity? Water. Water. Our body is 80 plus percent water. It courses through every, every vein, every blood vessel in our, every brain, every cell is bathed in water. Our whole body's floating in water. We're basically just a we're, we're, a, we're, a, we're a sack of flesh, a vessel to hold water is what we are. And so what we do to this water determines our health. So the way you treat the water in your body determines your health. So what I mean by that is, is are you creating a, a favorable environment for your cells to be bathed in? Or are you creating an unfavorable environment and therefore you're going to have repercussions like diseases and sicknesses and, and uh, infections and, and uh, openness to, uh, to viral cleansings and whatnot. So what is food? Is food grown or made? Food is grown, and don't ever forget that. Food is not made, right? Th this, food, this is made in a factory. You know, this is made. So once something's made, it's not quite food anymore. Food is grown, not made. What is food? The word produce, right? We go around and we buy produce. Well, what are you if you're a farmer? Are you a consumer or are you a producer? And where on the economic ladder would you want to be? A consumer or a producer? Right, we want to be producers on the economic ladder. Do we want to just be at the bottom of the economic ladder, getting stuff and just being the bottom feeder and giving money and just working for our, our wage labor and just to, to then buy stuff that producers make? Or are we going to go ahead and climb the ladder and become producers? Because every farmer is a producer. They're a creator. They, they make things out of nothing. They're, they're, they team with, uh, with the creator to create new things that never existed, you know? So, uh, real quick too, um, we had a request if people could just turn off their Wi-Fi signal on their phone, just because it was bothering a, a few sensitive people that were in the class before. So if you, if you got your Wi-Fi signal on your phone right now, just go ahead and turn it off, just to minimize that, uh, the EMF pollution in the building. I appreciate that. But um, anyway, getting back to this, we want to be producers. We want to work our way up the economic ladder, right? We don't want to just be bottom feeders. So food equals what? Calories. Caloric. What is a calorie? It's a unit of energy. You go to Europe and, and instead of reading a label and it says calories in the United States, it says energy in Europe. So all calories is a unit of energy. It's a unit of energy that the body can burn and, it, and they have it down to a measurable science. What is energy? Currency, right? The, how, a, how water flows through the river banks. You know, the banks hold the currency. So, so it's the, the currency is the energy, is the food. So you can, you can literally produce currency. You can today. So, so now none of us have to say we're poor ever again. From this day forward, none of us in this room have to be poor because we know this equation right here. Food is produce, we become producers. Food is energy, energy equals currency. We make produce, we get currency. Super simple, bro. I've been living this, this code right here ever since I was a teenager. And it works. Uh, food is grown, not made. Does everyone understand what I was breaking down here? You cool with that? Grown, not made. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to when, when I do my natural farming presentation, I talk about farming and when it all changed. 
and it changed during World War II and the Industrial Revolution and the industrialized farming, right? Well, at the same time, the food changed too. Right around the same time because all these bigger heads of war and bigger heads of industry were really trying to clamp down on the human race and control it. And John's going to get into a lot of this in his presentation of how they actually succeeded in that. But um, that's when we had processed food introduced to our, uh, our, our system, our human biome, into our communities. Cheap byproduct food. So usually it would, it would be the, they'd be feeding us byproducts of byproducts. So think like bologna or think, uh, you know, uh, some kind of like child cookie or cracker or something. They're all byproducts of byproducts. So you're using like the, the shells of the grains to make a new product or something, you know. So they're not even food like product. They're, they're not even food, they're food like products. Um, prior to World War II, 80% of human beings, listen to this, in the United States were farmers or had something to do with food production. 80%. So that means out of all of us, like only two of us weren't farmers. You know? Now, we're lucky if we got 2% and maybe in a given population like the Big Island, you could get up to 5%, but 2% nationwide is about the average uh, amount of people that farm or have something to do with food production. And don't tell, so you can't tell me that's not by design. Every, everyone would love to grow their own food, but they've cut us off from the information and knowledge how. And that's why we're here today. This is a really good point that I want to talk about before I really get into start breaking down food in this presentation. There is a 30 year study done showing the number one contributing factor to being unhealthy. And that's just a, a general term, unhealthy. That could be diseased, it could be obesity, could be uh, uh, digestion problems, could be mental problems, but unhealthy. You know what the number one contributing factor was? It wasn't eating meat, it wasn't breathing shitty air, it wasn't any of that, it was processed food. Processed food was the number one contributing factor to the decline in human health. Processed food. Up here, we're gonna break these down a little bit later, but you know, this is what they're feeding your kids, you know? You stick it in the microwave, you know? We'll pass this around later. You could read some of these ingredients that the, uh, the native and, and uh, local populations here have been eating since they were two years old. You know, some families grew up, they thought this was cheese right here. You can read the ingredients, there's no cheese in it. You know, so this is what we're talking about. Why people are, are slowly declining in health. And so as soon as the health declines, this declines too. And so really what they're doing is stifling human potential. That's the main goal. If you ever like went to one of their think tanks or something of these weird dudes that are heads of these industries and stuff, stifling the human ability because then you're easier to control, manipulate, extract equity from, and all the above. All right, so processed foods and food-like substances. John's going to break this down a lot better than I'm going to, but we're going to get into it real quick. Frankenfoods of the 21st century. GMO never existed on the planet Earth. Preservatives never existed in the way they do now. Artificial flavors never existed in the way they do now. Pesticides never existed in the way they do now. This right here is critical. And we're going to stop and talk about it for a second. You guys ever heard this word right here? Excitotoxins. You ever heard that one? Okay, excitotoxins are deep. Let's see if I miss some of these slides though. Yeah, I was just gonna show you like some, like this is, a, this, is, this is food that you grow, not made. That's my son there with our, with our uh, cilantro harvest. Brain food. And then here's, now we're, now we're here at the Franken foods, right? We can look at this, like what are these, some of these say, if they, if, they, if they labeled food honestly, right? Colon cancer dogs, for sure diabetes drink, ADHD flakes, uh, heart disease spread, 
you know, this crazy uh, acrylamide chips, you know, cheese food with the question mark, chemical helper, you know, and the baby's like, give me my flakes, and the mom's like, what the fuck, I don't know what to do, you know, I'm just confused, <coughs> because uh, they, they've been tricking me ever since I was born and feeding me all kind of adulterates and all kind of weird stuff, so I don't even know what to think, but I got this little being right here who was born perfect, and uh, all of a sudden, I'm feeding them these things, you know? Right. Because of lack of information and lack of knowledge, you know? Our people suffer because of lack of knowledge. That's, a, that's your average grocery store, you know? All of that can sit there for years. It can sit right there for years and you could go eat it. Years you could have that sit on there. That's why they made it like that. They fooled us into eating these things. None of this should go in our body. Not one of those products is made is fit for human consumption. Excitotoxins. Okay, here we go. This gets deep. Any group of neurological active compounds, including glutamate and asparatine, that is highly high concentrations have detrimental excitatory effects on the central nervous system and may cause injury to nerve cells. Okay? They're putting these in our food on purpose. Excitotoxins. Now I want to take you to this article real quick. And we're going to read about a few of these excitotoxins. Okay. Six most dangerous excitotoxins. You guys ready for this? Okay. Have you ever felt compelled to take another bite? Despite feeling full, the concern may not be a lack of self-control. In fact, the issue may not even be with you at all. It could be an excitotoxin. These non-essential amino acids stimulate or excite the umami or savory taste buds, making food seem more flavorful than it really is. These compounds are abundant in most processed foods and restaurant meals. And many people are unknowingly consuming these compounds in large amounts on a daily basis. Know your food. Despite public outcry, processed food remains loaded with excitotoxins, all of which have been linked to brain cell death, infertility, issues with sexual development in children, aggressive behaviors, and hormonal disorders. Now, so did that kid have ADHD or did someone feed him the wrong food? You know, we got to ask these questions. Should that kid have been pumped with Ritalin or should we have changed his diet? Simple things that we try to paste over with modern solutions instead of just getting back to simplicity. Um, here is a list of the six most dangerous excitotoxins. We all know MSG, it's been banned but yet finds its way into choke food all the time. There's MSG in these right here, so, sold in the shelves in the store. MSG is still widely used. It's a salt form of glutamate or glutamatic acid. Has been known to trigger headaches. Glutamate easily crosses the blood-brain barrier stimulating cell receptors that trigger cell death. While the body naturally produces glutamate when needed to trigger cell termination, flooding the body with dietary glutamate can seriously disrupt normal cellular function, especially in the brain. Avoid foods with MSG, but don't think food is free of MSG just because you don't see it on the ingredient list. MSG also appears under these names. Natural flavoring, flavoring, hydrolyzed vegetable protein. Think about all these wheat meats or all these uh, fake meats that are in the store they're trying to sell you. Autolyzed protein, plant protein, textured protein, yeast extract, nutritional yeast, carrageenan, anything with glutamate. So crazy. Yeah, it does because you know why they can do this? Because it's up to you to have the wisdom to decipher. It's not up to the person selling the thing. The person can sell you anything they want lawfully. It's up to you to have the knowledge to decipher what you're going to eat. That's why they're free of they're free of blame. Right? Are we going to blame them? They just put it out there. We buy it. We can't blame them. We have to educate ourselves and uplift. It's like how they disguise aspartame. Exactly, you know, it's, right. It's, it's almost impossible 
I would never, a care gaining, I would never right. think that that right. was MSG. Right, right. I have a sensitivity to MSG mm -hmm. more than, so I, I look. This makes me mad. This makes us mad. It makes us all mad. Aspartame or aspartic acid acts very similar to glutamate. This non-essential amino triggers M NMDA receptors in cells, another of the cellular receptors used to initiate cell death. Most humans receive aspartame through consuming aspartame as an artificial sweetener, often hidden in many processed food. It has been linked with serious neurological effects such as headaches, sleep disorder, and seizures. There's a couple more I want to cover here. I'm not going to do them all. Uh, there's domoic acid, which is found naturally occurring in shellfish. Overconsumption has led to development of epilepsy, especially in the elderly. Uh, seafood eater pick wild caught varieties, fish like salmon, trout, or tuna, or link up with a local fisherman and don't buy no crap from that's shipped in. This way you receive your omega-3s without excitotoxins. Um, I'm going to skip LBOAA, you can check it out later, but this one right here got me. Cysteine. Check this stuff out. Industrially created by hyd hydro hydrolysis of human hair and poultry feathers. What? Doesn't that make you think? And think about that. Think about this too. Think about this. This is what made me think. I wonder where Supercuts sells all their hair. No, for real. Where is an indus a food industry getting human hair? You, you got, yeah, I bet you follow the contracts. I guarantee you Supercuts got a contract with the food industry. I, I guarantee you. I mean, I can't guarantee you, but I'm guaranteeing myself. I'm convinced. Right. Industrially created by the hydrolysis of human hair and poultry feathers. This excitotoxin is important for artificial flavor creation. It reacts with sugars in a process known as Mallard's reaction, resulting in a meaty and savory flavor High cysteine levels are associated with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. <coughs> Number six, casein. This protein compound occurs in cheese at naturally high levels. 20% of, of casein is glutamatic acid, which makes for a tasty treat. However, it also increases a glutamate overload. Casein is often used by food producers to, uh, can you watch your arm there, Brother? Uh, food producers to improve flavor, although it is often also frequently used to increase protein levels in fitness products. So you got to think about what these guys are doing. Like they're they're having a think tank and they own a business and they're like, man, how do we make money? Okay, well, I'll have the graphic designer. You'll put a big muscly dude on here and a sexy lady, and then we'll get these cool bold words and it'll look all gold and black and. And it'll look brilliant. And then we'll fill it with casein. That's like a penny per pound that we got from, the, from leftover from the meat dairy industry. And we'll just sell it to bodybuilders. Right? That's, that's how these people think. And they're doing it. And then the bodybuilder guy's like, oh, yeah. Look, it's full of casein. It says 40 grams per scoop. I'm going to buy it. I don't know. All right. Points to remember, excitotoxins such as MSG, asparatine, and castine have been linked to several adverse health effects, some of which may be irreversible. Some people have reported allergic reactions such as hives, shortness of breath, rashes. Others have reported well-known MSG headaches, as well as rapid heartbeat, stomach cramping. The most serious reactions involve depression, paranoia, cancer, heart, brain injury, the whole nine yards. Have you had a reaction to MSG or other? Okay. So yeah, that's excitotoxins. Any questions about excitotoxins? One, one thing to add, aspartame was first developed as a uh, chemical weapon. And it, was, and it worked really well. High levels of it were spread over populations and it created all the things you just said. That's why I, I remember that. And they decided that it wasn't a good chemical weapon because it was so sweet that it could be identified because because one of the rules of chemical weapons is no one can know they're getting a chemical weapon, right? So they, they said, oh, we can't do it. And that's why uh, Rumsfeld grabbed a hold of it. Some government consumer took it, from the, took it from the military and then brought it into the, uh, during Reagan or something, and that's when it became a uh, food product. 
And, uh, and once, ag once again, <laughs> once again, a some kind of think tank sitting around with a byproduct, you know, from some other industry, going, what the fuck do we do with this stuff, you know? If you look, Rumsfeld made millions. Rumsfeld, right. That, that was the, uh, the uh, defense secretary under, under Bush and Reagan and Bush. Both I Bushes. With I think yeah. Chief of staff the right. Slime ball. Yeah. Let's watch this real quick. This is super interesting. Check this out. I just want to show you what's really going on in the world. They sell, they're going to sell this to consume after they're done making it. What is it? This is the, the height of what we're talking about. This is the pinnacle of processed food. Watch. Watch this. It's a cabbage. It's a cabbage. They're gonna sell. They're gonna sell it to food producers and restaurants to eat. There, there's your, uh, there's your fu that's the future of food right there if we don't all stand up and do something. Cabbage. Right? That's real, that's going on, that's going on right now. Um, I have this other video but I can't find it. The, another video shows, um, I can't find it right now, but another video shows plastic rice being produced. Did they use plastic to make that cabbage? Probably cellulose and a bunch of other uh, weird, in, yeah, some kind of byproduct of this or that. Also came across a video and I've watched several videos that uh, show plastic rice. And like they'll mix it in and even do it like 50-50 so it kind of gets hidden into the rice. And a lot of even rice you can find on the island has plastic in it. So be careful with that. Okay, we're past the scary stuff and now we're going to get into the good stuff. But before I do, I want to break this down real quick and talk about microbes again. Um, microbes, physiology of man, digestion, and our pH. Now remember when we started out, we talked about every cell is being bathed in water, of some, in, in a fluid, in bodily fluid. And the, fluid, the, the pH of that fluid determines the health of that cell. How long we can keep that pH out of balance is how long that cell can survive at a healthy rate. So basically, uh, they have scientists went back in the early 1900s that have taken, like they took a, chicken, a chicken's heart, or cells from a chicken's heart, one or the other, put it in a petri dish, kept uh, changing the, the fluid that, that bathed it. Uh, they would change it every so often to keep it at a perfect pH and a perfect um, equilibrium to support cell life. And they kept the cells alive for over 100 days just in that bathing it in the right pH material. So the point being, the death of the cells come when we eat the Franken foods, obviously, but also lack of oxygen, lack of, uh, of good water, you know, and those kind of things. So knowing that we're an electric body with, cell, with, with our, our uh, cells being bathed in, in a pH fluid, we want to keep this at a neutral state and even towards an alkaline state. Your body naturally buffers itself throughout the day depending on the food you eat and it'll dump calcium from your body and will actually leach it from your bones if, if, uh, if it needs to. If, you're, if your pH in your body is too acidic, you're going to end up with osteoporosis when you're older because it's going to be leaching calcium and other buffering agents from the, the last resort would be your, your bones because you're not giving it for the right food and environment. Digestion. So I have this theory and I don't, it's not proven or anything, but it goes back to soil food web. In the soil food web, in natural farming, we teach feed the soil, don't feed the plant. 
the soil will feed the plant, right? We all know that from natural farming classes of the past. A little bit different approach than your conventional where it's direct inject into the plant, bypass the microbe, right? And that, that was a couple classes ago, or last class when I did the presentation on the war on microbiology. There's a war on microbiology and part of it's in our stomach, right? So here's my theory is that what if we think of it like this? Don't feed yourself, feed the microbes. The microbes will feed you. You know what I mean? And I, like, this is just my thoughts that I have. You f feed, feed the microbiology so you provide the right food for the microbiology and that in turn will feed you the right nutrients you need. What do you think about that, John? Uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, when, when you get to, to that level, it's also, you go back to KNF, you also have to be inoculating correctly in here before you do that. Because it's really when you eat, it's really not what you eat, it's what you can absorb. And it's not really even what you, it's what you absorb, but it's also how you eliminate it. Too. And so when we start dealing with that, we can go down a big rabbit hole right. with, the G, with the GMOs and, and the different genes that they added and how it affects our guts and stuff like that. And so what you're saying is right. And, and to get back to your pH thing is what I was tripping on when you're talking about that. The mass, we, we increase the CO2. That Acidic. And the CO2 creates acidity. And so everyone mm -hmm. that's wearing these masks that is slowly creating a, Acidic. an acid condition Acidosis. in the body. Right. And considering that 30 to 40 percent of our gross national product is uh, health care, this wearing the mask actually financially works out really well for the United States. You know, they, they go, oh, wear your mask, and people are going to have every one of those problems that you're saying. But yeah, as far as that goes, I could get into it. And it's about 15 yeah. minutes yeah. to talk about how you do that. Okay. Because there's an intelligence also that right. you have to understand that. that, that these organisms in our body, we also have organisms in ourselves. We're not just this one machine created with a... With a 10 to 1. Body. Remember last class? 10 to 1 microbes to human cells right. in your body. Right. And so these all are intelligent beings also. And if it wasn't for the fake food, the fake colors, the fake flavors, the, all these fake things, a hundred years, and I, I was going to talk about that, but... but, but, but yeah, well, well, we'll do, you break it down during your thing. Oh, well, it's, it's like, it's like, if. These, these, this is like the first thing I read when I was about seven years old that probably created a lot of who I am, okay, back in the early 50s. It was a study they had done, just as they were creating these Franken foods and, and nutrition became a big a science, right? They took 50 kids, right, and they, and they put 50 kids in a room with bowls of food three times a day. Just bowls all over the place. Everything from ice cream, you know, Matt, back then it was fairly oh, yeah. food, right? Beans, carrots, meat, hamburgers, sandwiches. And they just let the kids loose, four, five, six years old, you know, supervised, they would choke, and just let them graze, basically. And then they took another 50 kids and fed them a control, what the nutritionist said scientifically they should eat three times a day. After about three or four months, they test, and the kids that were grazing were way healthier. healthier. Okay, that's because we have an innate sense. So all the microbes, it's, it's, it's a circular thing. The microbes in your gut that are good are going are gonna to create an experience in your body to tell you what to eat. Right. So by the colors, which are called right. phytonutrients, the colors and the flavors all indicate the minerals and the substances that you need for health and, and, and exactly what you're saying with gut. Because these, also these gut bacteria are also the producers of, of the, uh, what are the mood enhancers, the right. serotonin, the tryptophan, right. and stuff like that. And so it's all about all of that. And so when we start feeding our kid at an early age these synthetic colors, there's a disconnect, and they no can't longer tell what's know good for them. What to eat? The only way they know what to eat is what they see on the TV or what their friends are eating. And the smells and the taste and the colors, which were there for millions of the years, the excitotoxins take over now. Yeah, and it, it's just it, it's, so it's like it's very, it's very complicated. So yeah, so that's great. That that's man giving me chicken skin. I had a couple mind blowing moments while he was talking, and. Uh, we, we, uh, we have documented proof of microbes that control sheep. And what I mean by that is they infect their brain to do what the microbe wants them to do. So first of all, they, the, microbe will infect a, the microbe will infect an ant and it will tell the ant to crawl to the tip of the grass. The microbe wants to get in the belly of the sheep. So it tells the ant to get to the tip of the grass. That's the way it gets up the grass petal. 
and then the sheep will come eat it and that's where it wants to go into the sheep's belly. So it literally mind controls the ant to, to be, to, for the ant to sacrifice itself to the sheep. So what John just said, the microbes, they're, they're, are, they're not our human cells, but yet they have consciousness that influences our own. Deep. And like he said, as a, as a natural man, as a natural child, you recognize what to eat by colors, by scent, by hearing, by your sensory organs. And when those are deprived from going to shitty schools and eating crappy food, then those, all those sensory organs get deprived too. And now as adults, we need to re-educate those organs because they're still there. They're just dormant. Okay, now we're going to get into a few dietary choices. And, uh, and, you know, just what you might want to consider eating and not eating. Dietary pioneers. The native people of the world are the dietary pioneers. You study any native culture, you don't got obesity. You don't got uh, heart disease. <laughs> These are all introduced diseases from the Franken foods and the environmental degradation. So we go back to native peoples of the world. And uh, we realize that native diets are the key to our human health. Eating native food is the surest way to health. Um, you could think stuff like, and I'm not a, an advocate of this, but you could think in this line, the blood type diet. Blood type diet kind of bases on that theory of where where'd your ancestors come from? You know, because you should tap into that food from that region if you want it to be best biologically tuned to you. Now, a lot of us like myself, are you know 20 different nationalities deep you know so might not be so easy to find your native food source but yet you could experiment with different ones from your tribes and realize which fits into your gut biome and to your physiology the best so we look to native people anytime you're ever wondering uh, hey man how do I get healthy oh you're in Hawaii well eat what the Hawaiians ate hey man where, I'm in Brazil I eat well eat what those native Indians of Brazil ate you know and, and you'll, you'll know that you can get back on track, you know. This man here is uh, Arnold Errett. Arnold Errett is a, is a uh, scientist who got well persecuted in his time because he went against the science of the day. Just like last week we talked about, um, uh, we talked about some other guys that, that were basically blackballed by the scientific groups of the day because uh, they didn't fit the narrative for the industry to make money. Tesla. Tesla is one of them. But yesterday, we, I mean, last week we, talk, we talked Beauchamp. about, uh, who was it? Beauchamp. Oh yeah, Beschamp, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, last week we talked about uh, Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, yeah. okay. and his germ theory versus Beschamp, or Beschamp, Beschamp which uh, has a terrain theory of uh, infection. And we broke that down where Bachamp, you don't, he don't get no bligh today. You don't see him taught about in schools because that would blow the cover off the medical industry and this whole. Um, his, uh, his forerunner, or so basically what he, he's saying is what I broke down over here. That's for, direct verbatim from him is that your cell is bathed in pH fluid and, uh, and the, 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 the pH of that fluid determines your health. Remember when we were reading about excitotoxins, a lot of them were, were like cellular death targets, you know? Um, he talks about fasting. He was an advocate of fasting when in Europe that wasn't really a practice at the time. He coined the phrase the mucusless diet. He was definitely a, a vegetarian or vegan, and he was really concerned with pH of the blood and the bodily fluids. You can check him out. I suggest writing down this name and studying him more. His direct forerunner now today, who is still alive, is Dr. Robert Morse, who uh, who's all over Instagram all the time. And you can, if you check out alkaline diet or alkalinity, uh, mucusless diet, Robert Morse is more likely than not going to come up. And uh, here's a quick quote from him. Generally, when the crowd is walking one way, you should walk the other. 
on this planet, when you see the multitudes believing in something, it's probably wrong. So that's just a little insight from Dr. Robert Morse. This guy's crucial. He's all about juice fasting. Uh, you can fa you don't have to just be a, a you know a juice faster your whole life. You can do it to correct imbalances and get your body back into balance. You know, so check out Robert Morse. Um, here's another one. Your diet is your number one key to success. What you eat, drink, breathe, and what you put on your skin is how you bring the outside world in. Dr. Robert Morse. This is uh, Elijah Muhammad. He's uh, from the Nation of Islam, but what he brought to basically to the uh, black man or the African in the West is to not eat pork, which was heavily given, being given to the uh, melanated populations of the time. Like byproducts of pork were like one of the number one things for, for ex-slaves and slaves and whatnot. And he came and said, don't eat no pork, which is was, was huge. And that's why I got him up here today. And then, um, and if you look at the, any religion, really almost 99.9% .9 of religions tell you don't eat pork either. So there's something to it. I'm not going to quite break that down right now, but you guys can look into that. Is that true of Hawaii? They didn't eat pork? Or is the, so if we, if we go to the Hawaiian culture, we can, we can go that the, 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 the pig was a representation of man. So like if you want, instead of sacrificing a man, you could symbolically sacrifice a pig in his place. The pig, the pig was eaten very rarely. Does anyone want to add yeah, to that? Yeah, I'll add something to it. Um, in my studies with, with some local guys over here that actually was holding some true knowledge, they said the pig was used was their sewage system. Yeah, garbage compactor. And, and they would shit and they would throw their grass garbage and the pig was there. And when the white man first came and saw the pig and they said, hey, eat that thing. I want to eat that thing, they would laugh What are you talking so about? Hard. No, they would sell it to them and let them eat it, right? <laughs> And so then the Z's came through the Hawaiian, night turned the Hawaiians were dead, and then the man, white men, brought in pigs. To yeah, the, the European the, pigs. The, the European pig that denuded the forest, they used cattle. And so the native, the native pig was a little guy. They had to eat pigs eventually, yeah. Because they were forced to. They were forced yeah. to because there was no more food. They had eaten down the breadfruit trees, the tarot right. was all uprooted because there was, they brought in all these animals so that their ships could stop and they could go hunting. They just, but all, you know, already 90% of the Hawaiians were dead. They were, their connection to their culture was gone. The whole, uh, traditional Hawaiians never ate pigs. It was the last Bingo. thing to think about. Right, it right. It wasn't even close. Great, great answer. Um, Elijah Muhammad also touched on his whole thing was one meal a day for optimal health. He actually has a book called that gave me the title for my presentation, How to Eat to Live. And he says eat one meal a day at noon. Now they call it intermittent fasting. Yeah, now they call it intermittent fasting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the new thing. <laughs> that is the new thing. That is the new thing. But but long time what the brethren knew, you know. This is my guy right here, Dr. Sebi. Sebi. Yeah. And Dr. Sebi, he's the alkaline diet or the electric diet, bo borrowing from Harold Earnhardt and from Africa. His is an African-based diet. He says. They took us from Africa, but they didn't bring our food, right? So they got us eating all this food that doesn't connect to our native DNA. Therefore, we're sick mentally, physically, and otherwise. Same with the Hawaiians. Same with any native population. They, they, they enslaved us, but they didn't give us our food. They replaced it with European vegetables, wheat, uh, oriental rices, all kind of stuff that wasn't quite for you in particular. Or maybe it was if you're from the Orient or from Europe. Uh, Dr. Sebi, alkaline diet, electric diet. He goes beyond just a plant-based diet and he takes it to one step further to uh, no hybridized food. And, and his reasoning goes like this and, I, and I'm pretty sure it's accurate is that once man takes God's creation and crosses it, a starch molecule binds to the new offspring that wasn't existent in the native food. So this new starch molecule is the, the, the solvent or the, uh, the, the mechanism that will start breaking down your health because it adds an acidic component to the food. The pH has changed. 
and, and basically the mechanism is called glycoproteins. And glycoproteins are starches and pro amino acids that combine and make a coating on our cells. All our cells are covered in glycoproteins, which allows communication through those glycoproteins is what would protect us from a virus. It will identify it in that way. So there's seven or eight traditional starches that, that we need to have to have proper glycoprotein. One of the major ones to go to SEBI was the, is the tapioca, or we call mm -hmm. it cassava, which is all around the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and just, just as in, when black people, people of color came to the United States, a lot of them had sickle cell anemia. Right. right. Now sickle cell was a, was a, a, they evolved, sickle cells evolved to protect against malaria. So mm. they were healthy when they were eating high cassava because of the high vitamin uh, component, the cyanide vitamin that, wow. that's in it. But when they came here and they weren't eating these different uh, starches, because the only starches we eat now are the starches that could be stored. Right, long-term so, storage. So we have long-term storage and, and also starches. Commodity to send yeah, around. Yeah, commodity, right. We can go into that too. So basically, I'm just supporting what you're basically saying. So Brilliant. Yep. Yep. So that so so that's a, a difference that SEBI brings to the table than a lot of the other dietary choices that we can make, and that and t and trust me, to live that life, we're here on this earth right now. This alkaline life is very challenging. You think the vegan life is challenging, or the vegetarian life, like the alkaline life, like man, there's like there's a list that you can find online of alkaline foods, and it's limited very limited because it's only God created food not man created food any questions about these guys oh last guy real quick well, that's why fermented foods are so good because they help alkalize they, they alkalize yeah. and they break down they pre, pre, pre what kind of food uh, fermented, fermented foods food. Arius Latham he's a crucial guy um, he's all about what he call. he's a raw foodist but he also doesn't say he's a raw food. He says his food is sun-cooked. Why do you cook it? It's already cooked by the sun. That's what ripening is. When the thing ripens, it becomes soft. It's being cooked by the sun over time, developing sugars, developing starches, developing nutrition. And when it's soft and ripe is when it, the oven's bing. That's how he looks at, at food. He says he's not a raw food. He's a sun-cooked guy, you know? So he's saying there's no, per, there's no purpose to further cook your food after the sun's already cooked it. And he doesn't eat anything that takes further cooking either. That brings me to the Rasta man in, in the concept of ital. It's a, it's a uh, short form of natural. And ital means pure, clean, and no animal products. And, that, and that's a... Uh, that's what influenced me in my life to, to try to clean up my diet or my, we call it a livet. So the Rasta man doesn't have a diet, he has a livet because we don't want to die, we want to live. Any questions about any of these guys? Before we move on? There's like salt in the ital diet. Yeah, so a lot of uh, ital diet, they don't want any processed salt. Um, you can use uh, celery as a high sodium content to salt your food and sea salt, pure sea salt is also totally allowed. Uh, some, some Rastas and elders might say no salt at all. But the purpose of that is, is that America and the, and the West has over salted our food where we don't taste our herbs and our spices and our vegetables anymore because they're over salted. So the Rasta man says easy on the salt and you can taste that that tomato and that chocho -cho and, and whatever you're eating you can actually taste those flavors and get the microbes and the reaction used to those and start craving those real foods instead of just salt and MSG and all this nonsense good salt, question salt I feel like is for food that's devoid of nutrients that actually give it flavor so we salt things that don't have as much flavor brilliant right and just like Drake said remember he's like he's like no one just eats chicken. They put a bunch of herbs and salt and spices like plants on it, you know, because that, that meat don't taste good, but the plants do. Um, the Essene Gospel of Peace and, and the man called Yoshua or the Christ. Talk about fasting and enemas, purging the bowel. And uh, yeah, that he draws out, can draw out 
draw out um, parasites through prayer and fasting. There's this one where, where in this gospel of peace, Christ comes upon an afflicted man. He's in the woods, kind of, oh, I'm so hurting, I'm so hurting, I'm possessed, you know. And, he, and so what does Christ do? He gets a glass of milk and he puts it next to the man and he prays over the man and sure enough, this big worm crawls out of his mouth and jumps right into the milk. And so he purged that man of that parasite, you know. But that's another good one. You guys could read that. It's called The Essene Gospel of Peace. And uh, it was really one of the first books that helped me grasp this concept of Aital a little bit better because it, this is, it, it's written like it's an ancient manuscript or something. All right. Yeah. yeah, pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a lot of controversy surrounding it. We'll, we'll not get into that right now. But there's a guy, Theodore Szynski. He's the guy who supposedly had access to the vaults of the Vatican and the Dead Sea Scrolls and these other scrolls that are hidden from mankind. And he came out with the Essene Gospels of Peace, which is further teachings of Yoshua the Christ. And uh, that's how the story goes. But we don't... Right, right. It, it sounds good if you want people to come to your lecture, right? Yeah. But anyway, it's great information, regardless of where it came from. My Food Guide Pyramid. Not the Food Guide Pyramid, but My Food Guide Pyramid. Uh, can use for healing purposes or lifestyle choice. So any of these choices can be, you can do it for your life and, and live a or dedicate to it. Or you can just do it because you have like diabetes or you have an abnormality, you know? or some kind of issue with your blood or your bones or something and you want to correct it. So it doesn't mean that you have to be a vegan the rest of your life. It just means that you're going to get your health back on track and then be conscious of what you eat after you got it on track. So when I'm talking about this, I'm not, again, trying to convince anybody of anything to do one thing. I just want to give you the information so you can make a conscious, wise decision of how you want to lead your lives. So here at the very bottom and the lowest ring of this pyramid, I have the standard American diet. It's called the craving diet. It's, it's based in lust and gluttony. You, you feed into your craving and your animal instincts. You, you're all about excitement from food, excitotoxins and addictions. Um, it, it can lead to depression from food and different bad thoughts and stuff. So that's, that's your standard American diet. We've talked about all those processed foods and stuff already today, right? Well, moving up, up the rung, and we're going we're gonna to come back to this too after I'm finished, so just hang in there. Food guide pyramid diet. So this is, we all grew up in, in our elementary school teachers tried to tell us about the food guide pyramid, and you should eat so many servings of grain a day, and two to three servings of vegetable, two to three servings of fruit, use your fat sparingly at the top, one to two meat, one to two dairy, right? You guys all got that training, right? Yeah, we all did, because we all went through the American school system. These guys didn't, but we all did. And uh, we got the food guide pyramid. I'm sure they got a version of it taught to them in their school, because it's a new world order, that's all together anyway. But anyway, it's based on science. It's based on dieting. How many in here did your mom tell you they're on a diet your whole life? No? Yeah. Show of hands. <laughs> my mom's always on a diet? Right. The, the moms from my era were always on a diet their whole fucking life. They're all counting calories and doing jazzercise and stuff. That was the era, you know? It was the era of science and dieting. The 80s, 90s. 70s. Whole food is the next rung. Okay, I don't, I don't eat any of this crap. I just eat whole foods that come from the earth that God made, that nature made. I just eat, I, I hunt my own things and I eat those animals. I grow my own vegetables. I forage for food. When I go to the grocery store, I just buy whole foods. Whole foods, not adulterated. Just whole in their own their own. These are, this is not whole food. None of these are whole food. It has to be in its own packaging from the Creator. So that could be an animal also. But this is a great place to be. If we can make it here, 
man, you're going to be a healthy individual no matter what you're eating, if it's whole food. I guarantee you. Because remember why we started the class, the number one contributing factor to bad health? Processed food. Whole food, you're eliminating 90% of, of issues. 90% will be gone if you just eat whole food. Next up the ring, we, we eliminate uh, flesh, animal flesh. Eliminated. Animal flesh is highly, 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 highly acidic, super hard to digest, turns to mucus in your intestines, takes days if not weeks to eliminate, putrefies, changes your microbial gut flora. So we just want to be careful eating meat. Maybe not do it every day, maybe do it once a week. Whatever, whatever is, works for you. But vegetarian, they just eliminate their, I mean, Okay, so, so these two, vegan and vegetarian, you can be, they could be some of the most unhealthy diets on the planet. Vegan, these guys could drink Cokes and eat Oreo cookies. Vegetarians could eat Kraft Singles and ramen, you know. So not necessarily, you still got to be smart with how you're eating here, but you're eliminating meat. Vegan, you're eliminating the dairy and the, uh, the poultry. Uh, the eggs, you know, and and you're still stick. You're hopefully hopefully doing these two. You're sticking with this one still. That's why you're as you're stepping up. You don't want to be bringing these two down here. Th then you're almost worse off than this guy. If you're like one of these guys, but, but but practicing down here, you're almost worse off just from the science guy that's on the food guide pyramid, because now you're lacking all certain nutrients and stuff, you know. So once you come into these realms, you want to be educated and you want to do it properly. And when you come to this realm, you really want to be educated and do it properly. And that, you know, is a raw food diet, sun-cooked diet. And the reason for that is, the reasoning behind raw food is that you're born, you're bo you're born with a certain amount of enzymes in your human body. So if you don't eat enzymes with your food, your body has to dump enzymes into your digestive system to break down the food. So what Ra is telling us is that we're, we're going to keep the enzyme intact to do its own digestion without depleting my stores of enzymes, which actually leads to aging, premature aging, uh, diseases and complications. Um, that's just a real general breakdown of Ra. The reason I'm doing this too, just to, I know a lot of people already know this stuff and it's real elementary and it's meant to be that way. I was getting water the other day and uh, I was telling a friend that was at the watering spot about my mom's vegan restaurant. A, a local Hawaiian guy behind me, oh brother, what are you talking about? Vegan restaurant. My doctor told me I should go vegan. I just had a heart attack and I have diabetes. My doctor recommend I should try vegan. Where's your mom's restaurant? So I just put a light bulb in my head. Like that, that man, did, I wish he was here. The reason why I'm having this class is for that man. He didn't know what vegan meant, how to approach it, how to even go about it. So that's what, that was kind of a motivation for this class, was like that, that elder and his hurting condition. Anyway, to get to the pinnacle, we got the mucusless electric alkaline diet that we already went over. That includes fasting, long stints of juicing. All these three can be considered ITAL because we're not dealing with animal. All these four, or one, two, three, four, five, can be considered natural. So mucus, music, mucus mucusless. So if you went on a straight juicer, it would get. Yep. If you're on if you're on the alkaline diet, you're on the mucusless diet. So you're not going to produce. You're not going to produce excessive mucus caused by what you ingest. That's my son. I have the problem with that right now. Yeah. That's a lot of a lot of people that are on these diets here are going to have problems with mucus, big time, and blockages, uh, artery, uh, all kind of health effects. These two are going to have the most health effects long term. Once you start getting here, ninety percent of the bad stuff falls away. Once you get here, 99% of the bad stuff falls away. You got to be super smart if you're doing this. And that's why I'm saying, even if it's just for a, a time or for a certain purpose to get back into health and you can keep that discipline for a good month straight. But then maybe it's not for a lifetime because that's hardcore. 
but I'm going to discipline myself for a month to get my stuff back and balanced and then I'm going to start eating whole food with only meat as a supplement not an everyday occurrence where it's clogging my system and that's what I'd recommend for people that still want to eat meat that's what I recommend like a vitamin I wouldn't, but I'm just saying those. I don't, I don't understand that. Okay. It's high in minerals, iron, calcium, stuff like that. You can so. get those things from plants. No, right, 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 right. We're just trying to be friendly to everyone yeah. that. that yeah. Okay, I'm just asking. <laughs> That's why I said, like, I, I, I'm not going to eat meat as a supplement, but if you guys choose to, think of it that way as a supplement. Think of it as, because it's hard to convince someone that loves meat to not eat meat or that it's bad for them, and I'm not here to argue with anybody. Also, in certain environments, meat, meat can hurt plants that we can't eat into something that can be used for survival. So in indigenous cultures, they would eat the weaker animals and stuff. They would grow animals. They wouldn't take the best animals. They would take the, the oldest animal or something like that and eat it and consume it to get their nutrition because they didn't have it around them. But they wouldn't, it wouldn't be a big part of the meal. It would be little strips of meat. It would be a special thing. Mm -hmm. They had to for the deficiencies that they had experienced because they wanted to live in Hawaii. But it didn't have huge farms. Really, like Eskimos. I guess you know, people like that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll maybe I'll jump. May I add something from a female perspective? Go I'm for a, it. I'm a holistic nutritionist, and I've just been nice. through different things on this level, and I've gone vegan, and I've eaten meat, and I kind of worked kind of. For me, it was when I was anemic, and not every woman is anemic, but some mm -hmm. people have a hard time getting iron, and in meat, it's more bioavailable, so we can use it easier. Um, iron is, we can find it in, you know, in plants and like moringa or different Sesame, right. and different things. Anything that's green is going to have some iron in it. But at the same time, it's whether you have enough of it in your body or not. It's like menstruating women would need more of it. And sometimes that's why, you know, before your period or after your period, you might feel like you'd want a little bit more. It just like that's not necessary all the time. So it can be right. simple. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought it up. But the reason why I wasn't, because I didn't really want to debate about this at all. I just wanted to kind of present the information because I knew that it's a debate every single time. I've been doing this for a long time. But I am, now that she mentioned, I'm going to talk about meat and dairy real quick and how I've, I personally view meat and dairy. So again, I'm not looking to argue. I'm just going to show you how I view it. I see it as a scavenger food or a survivor food. That's how I see it. Scavenger food or a survivor food. A food of last resort. It takes weeks or months to fully digest. It putrefies in digestion, disrupts microbial balance, takes extreme energy to digest, turns to acid in the body, leads to imbalanced disease and mucus buildup. So let's put that one to rest for now. Let's go to this. Masanobu Fukuoka. Yeah. In all of this, like when I think of moving things raw. It's not, it's like my body wants to crunch on something like potato chips or french fries. It's that crunchy. It, did any of these diets speak to that human desire? Human yeah, my dad, my dad has um, gone Ornish because it's injuries. That's a, it's a separate diet, like but it's really close to vegan. And his whole thing was having a hard time being at a higher level of the food scale because they don't have a lot of hard, crunchy things. And he started to eat broccoli and cauliflower Raw. in different forms. And for example, he was eating a lot of Impossible Burgers because oh. that fits his diet. But then he started to make um, meatless pasta, meatless chili. It's still cooked, but with late added broccoli and cauliflower. So when he ate it, it's not soupy pasta. When he eats it, it's if you don't look yeah, at it and see it as green, if you eat it and think, it, in his mouth he's chewing it and it tastes like meat pasta and he's chewing it so it's hard but he's still getting the nutrients. Yeah, there, there's eating. there's one to one replacements basically for everything, that, you know. Is that like a natural human need to crunch or that? Per, my personal opinion that you're, you're addicted to something. Yeah, he, his brain needs, he likes the flavor, he likes the taste. His brain needs something crunchy, and as soon as you had late added broccoli, his brain, his brain thought, 
was crunchy enough. I mean, I mean, man, although you want to say something? Grinders, so seeds and nuts would give you that crunchy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's so many crunchy things, and crunchy apple, daikon, I mean, there's so many things that are freaking crunchy out there. I guys used to talk about it, they would take rice, put it in their mouth, they wouldn't just chew it and swallow it, they would chew it for 15 minutes and it would turn sweet in the paste, and then they'd swallow it. That's how our teeth are set up, more as grinders mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We're not carnivores, so we don't have the ripping. Physiology. And other kind of stuff, the physiology. And yeah. Kind of kind of so we've just learned, it's all learned, what you need is, is generational. And we have genetic memories going back two or three generations, too. So it's not just breaking a three or four year old addiction, it's intergenerational. Right. Addiction. Right. And that's why a lot of this, a lot of what I'm going over is loaded. And what I mean by that is loaded with emotion. Right. So I'm trying my best, like, like, and I know I'm leaking some of my own beliefs into this because it's just naturally I'm the presenter and I'm doing that. But uh, I'm trying to stay neutral and just present quality information. And then you guys as the absorbers can then digest it and do what you will with it, you know? So back to, uh, to the, the study here. I always go to my guy, right? Masanobu Fukuoka, if you come to the class, I'm always talking about this guy right here. He's my guy. He's crucial. You should read his books. But anyway, he has a type of diet that he talks about in his book, uh, One Straw Revolution. And this is a pyramid that I made talking about Masanobu Fukuoka's diet of natural man. And he says there's four diets on the planet Earth that you can choose from. Number one down here, and, and you can remember the food, my food guide pyramid that I showed you, is the cravings diet or the, no, the diet of non-discipline, he calls it. This is when you just go at the whim of your mind, your cravings, your tongue, your emotions, your feelings, and you're a slave to, to what you want to eat. That's the diet of craving, that's the diet most Americans follow. He says then, next up, we've already discussed this, is the scientific diet of the Food Guide Pyramid, where a group of scientists and doctors sit in a room and they tell you what's best for you to eat. And they produce a chart, and then they give it to you to uh, give to a mass population. They teach about it in school, and they want you to follow a scientific diet based on theories. The next up would be the, what he calls the designer diet or the import diet. And he said this is where vegan, vegetarian, paleo, and these kind of things fall under. And he's saying that this is a, it's a high-end or a rich man's diet, he calls it. He goes, you want to be a vegan, and you, oh, you're going to be eating this imported thing from there, and, and you got this cool thing that you bought from the health food store. It's a superfood. It's, it's only 15 bucks an ounce, you know, yeah. but it's a superfood. It's going to give you all this energy. So that's the designer diet, right? But then he says there's another diet which eludes most people, and that's the diet of natural man. And there's a few rules to this diet. The diet of natural man is you eat only what's in your immediate surroundings, or that you can trade with a nearby neighbor. This diet is not limited to vegan, vegetarian, or any of those things, but is only limited what's available to keep you nutritiously fit in your region. So Masanobu Fukuoka talks about eating a, a bowl of miso soup with some daikon and carrots and some greens in it for, for a, a, a um, midday breakfast. And then he talks about at lunchtime after he's done with his daily work, he'll go down to the stream and he'll collect some snails. And he'll go fishing for a small fish. He'll bring that home. He'll cook that with... Um, whatever other vegetables are he harvested in his main surroundings. So you can see that it's uh, mainly fruit and vegetables that are in season and in your regions. Animals can be supplemented in times of hunger or need. And that's, that's what he says is the diet of natural men. Um, naturally eating what's in your region, not importing, not buying from markets, but, but really just living like an, a real human, a, a natural man in your environment. So for, for us here, fish would be a good part of Sure, if that's what you want. If, if to me it says... In, I want to know your view. <laughs> I, I'm not going to eat the fish, but you can. Animals can supplement in time of hunger or need. So say a time of need comes and my family's starving, 
I'll probably be getting some OPE and some uh, maybe grabbing a fish, you know? Otherwise not. But I don't need to, so why would I? Personally, you know? I got plenty of calories, I got plenty of vitality and health. Why would I go take an animal's life to supplement mine? It makes zero sense to me personally, you know? Okay, so that's the diet of a natural man, Masanobu style. I love this one because it's easy to remember and you can always see what, where people fall into. Are they just going after cravings and non-discipline? Are they telling you that they're on this like, oh no, I follow the food guide. Oh no, I'm a paleo. I only eat meat and no vegetables. You know, or you know, are they just kind of living in their natural environment and just not really philosophizing so much and just kind of being, you know? All right, diet of natural man. I'm just about to finish up here and then we can take a little break before John comes up and blows our minds. Okay, how to eat to live. Physiology, we went over those guys. Okay, native food for native people. So yeah, um, in conclusion, I want to encourage you to eat native foods of this land, of this Aina. I don't care where you came from, what your nationality is, what your background is, I encourage you to eat native foods of this land because this is where we live. Hearkening back to this idea. Taro instead of white rice. We need to eat tubers instead of white potatoes. We need to start incorporating fruits, vegetables that naturally grow here. It might be imported, but it's growing here naturally. We need to start eating all those things. We need to eat foods that grow easy, like our, our tree spinaches, our tapiocas, our breadfruits. Um, yeah, we need to just tap back into what nature provides and pretty soon the store becomes obsolete and we're living like this guy on the pinnacle and then uh, some uh, control mechanism hits the earth again and they're telling us we can't go to the store without a vaccine or an ID chip card. Yeah, and then we're like, what? Well then we're like, yeah, we're cool, man. We've been practicing this lifestyle already. We're good to go. We're, we're not dependent on your situation, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave you with a little bit from Masanobu, because I always do. The ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. That's what we're here for. The institute, why John's here today, why we're all here today. We're trying to perfect our humanness on this planet Earth. And even if that's innately in you and you don't even realize that, that's why you're here. I guarantee it. Uh, God in all ages appears as a disconnect, discontinuous continuum. Natural farming too, since antiquity, may have arisen and vanished and risen again to flourish. Natural farming is one of the spiritual lights that must be kept burning throughout the night. In this age in which we live, it is possible that if this light dies out, it will never kindle again. Natural farming is more than just a way of farming. It is without question the one and only path that remains for humanity to continue to survive on planet Earth. Should I read that again? Natural farming is, is more than just a way of farming. It is without question the one and only path that remains for humanity to continue for, to survive on planet Earth. That's pretty deep, man. That's what this dude said, man. Guy wrote five books. He's had thousands of students come to his farm. He's traveled around the world to teach natural farming. Is that your favorite one right there? This is a follow-up to, uh, to One Straw Revolution, which is a must. One, one Straw Revolution. you got to read that book. Okay, I'm going to read that. One Straw Revolution by Masanobu Fukuoka. It's also on audiobook on uh, whatever you call that, Audible. So yeah, I mean, I, when I read stuff like this, it makes me want to participate because if this wise man, this is a wise man. He's not just a man. He's a wise man. He's an elder. He said it's the one and only path for human survival. He didn't say like some religion or some faith or any of those things. He said natural farming. 
is the one and only path. I, I got to listen to that, man. That dude is super smart. Got to listen. Um, it must not be allowed to come to an end. Uh, whatever becomes of this old farmer is no concern, even if going to sleep. We must lay out the route by which our children and grandchildren continue to live on on this beautiful planet Earth. And that's my conclusion. Give thanks. What year did he say that? It's a good question. I think this was uh, published in... This was published in 87. No, but it was written. Yeah, I'm not sure. It said 1987 by Masanobu. In the what? Wasn't it? Wasn't he like 60s and 70s, Masanobu? That's when it became popular. Popular, right, right. Yeah, who knows when he made the quote? If you, if you, if you just look up One Star Revolution, a PDF pops up, and you can look at the book. On oh, cool! The you you can read it right off the internet. Right, right. All right, well, give thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Any questions? Oh, before we go, I wanted to do this. I'm sorry. I actually got a little more time till 12. We got 10 minutes till 12. I'm going to pass these around, and I just want you to make note. I'm like, let me read this real quick. Popcorn white chicken patty fritters, which is chicken breast with rib meat, water, soy protein concentrate, genetically modified cornstarch, isolated soy product, brown sugar, garlic powder, soy lettuce, and, and flavorings. I wonder, wonder how much hair, wonder how much human hair is in this. Um, there's breading, which is bleached wheat flour, white water, salt, cornstarch, dextrose, extractives of paprika, yeast, spice, sugar, autolyzed yeast extract, remember MSG, gar gum, uh, genetically modified corn starch, so I'll give your kids some GMO right here in the great old America. Um, yellow corn flour, extracts of turmeric garlic powder, uh, leavening agents, sodium acidic phosphorate, sodium bicarbonate, monocalcium phosphate. The french fries, they can't just be po potatoes and oils, they gotta be potato with canola oil, disodium dihydrogenate phosphate to promote color retention of course. Um, and then they got to add color to it because it would just be gray. So it's, there's caramel color, annatto extracts, and turmeric to make them yellow. Dextrose, there's some corn in here, but it's not just corn. It's corn and egg powder. And then there's a cake. There's a cake with wheat flour, sugar, whey protein, more egg powder, natural flavoring and leavening agents, water, soybean oil. There's sprinkles on yep. top of the cake with sugar, dextrose, wheat, starch, more modified corn starch, more canola oil, which is actually modified rapeseed oil, so that's a GMO, cellulose gum, color are added to make it look palatable. So that's, that's what America feeds their children. But then sometimes like the, the parents just don't know better, you know? This is, this is like what's really popular on the island here. Uh, I grew up eating lihi moi out of uh, lemons and oranges. Lihi moi is basically MSG around a dried prune. <laughs> Aspartame, MSG, the whole nine yards wrapped up on a prune, you know? Basically the worst thing you could eat. Anyway, I'll just read some of these things that aren't, ev I don't even know if there's a food product in here except for rice. Seems like rice is the only food product in here. The rest of it is just disodium 5 inocyanate, disodium succinate. You know, there's citric acid. Citric acid's a GMO. They grow out on molds. It's black mold, basically. G citric acid is not from citrus in these type of products. Uh, there's yellow 5, red 5, yellow 6, blue 1. Why, why do they need to put blue in? <laughs> it's almost like, did they just make this to kill us? Like, what, that's when you start asking, like, why does this company even exist? If they're really just trying to make a dollar and trick everyone? Or, do, or are they subsidized by some other more sinister thing? You know? Well, one good thing is my kids learned to read because I wouldn't let them eat anything. That they couldn't read on the label. <laughs> <laughs>
And then I also wanted to show you guys like that, that it, like it's not just about not eating like these craft singles, but, but now you got like some conscious human being that's come along in 2020 and made you something that's palatably similar and you can go a one for one replacement for your cheese. And what do we got in here? We have organic cashews, we have water that's filtered, organic coconut oil, organic rice miso paste, natural flavors, that's kind of questionable, yeah. nutritional yeast, sea salt, vegetable juice for coloring, and organic yeast extract and cultures. So basically a one for one replacement with what it seems to be about 95% whole food product, you know? Right here, we got a cup of noodle. This could be the worst food on the planet Earth. A cup of noodle is basically styrofoam that you eat, literally. Um, I don't need to read all this stuff, but what I wanted to show you there, yeah, there's a TBHQ as a preservative. That's a, a brain uh, disruptor. Um, what I wanted to show you though, is that's, that's the ingredient list for a cup of noodle. They feed this to our children. When I was in high school, every day we ate one of these, if not two. Because you could go buy it for a buck fifty at the at the office. Okay, you see all those? That's a there's gotta be over sixty ingredients in this thing. This one we got organic wheat flour and sea salt for the noodles. Just organic wheat flour and sea salt. For the for the flavor packet it's sea salt. Uh, powdered Chinese mushrooms, uh, onion and garlic powder, chili pepper powder, ginger powder, snow pea powder, sweet red bell pepper powder, green onion, black pepper, and seaweed powder, combos powder. So, so you pay a dollar more and your children get to eat the same thing that they think is still this, but they're nutritious. It's actually whole food, kind of, you know what I mean? So what I'm trying to do is just show you guys like, like it's not like you got all of a sudden be an electric alkaline diet just in your kids, you know, but just start slowly replacing these one for ones. You know, uh, my mom makes mayonnaise over there. She makes cream cheese over there. You can really barely tell the difference from the cow cream cheese and the cow uh, mayonnaise and stuff or the egg mayonnaise, you know, and it's really similar flavor, a similar texture and a similar experience. So it's like we're not really going too far out of the comfort zone. Take and bake sourdough, organic, non-GMO verified. Organic bleach, water, sea salt, and barley in this bread loaf. So tell me why do they need to put enriched unbleached flour, thiamine monotrate, bioflavonoids, folic acid, yeast 2%, vinegar, salt, sugar cane, wheat gluten, GMO expeller, pressed soybean oil, monotriglycerides, calcium phosphate, Enzyme, silicon dioxide, diglyceride, citric acid, ferraminic acid. Why do they need to put all that? They, the same thing is right here. It has none of that in it. You know? So all I'm trying to do is show you choices. And then we come to this. <laughs> this was just on a tree. It was sitting there like that, on a tree. Yeah, but what does it say? Right? <laughs> What's the ingredient list? <laughs> you know? Oh, it's single ingredient? No way. Oh, it comes in a, uh, a hermetically sealed package? Huh? Hermetically sealed package? Bro, science can't even do this. Science can't do this. Man can't do this. Hermetically sealed package? You know? I mean, come on, man. We got we to gotta awe at the creation. And then we got to eat the creation and eat earth. Earth provides everything. God provides everything. Nature provides everything. However you want to label it and look at it, it's all been provided for. Pre-packaged. The coconut comes with a bowl. Right. You can use it later. It comes with a bowl. It's like, oh, here's the water and here's a bowl to put it in. You're like, what? Cool. Thank you. You know? Brilliant. Uh, the, 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 the papaya tree makes straws. You know, it's like, what, what are we doing? All we're doing is, makes pipes, you know that. <laughs> All we're doing is mimicking nature and failing hard at it, right? All we do is mimics God's creation and we fail. Instead of just tapping into God's creation and succeeding. 
Because that's all he wants for us to do is live and, and be healthy and love, you know, or she or whatever you guys want to visualize when I say that word. And, and it also, just to come back to that real quick, when I say God in these classes, that's the most generic term for all of us just to understand what I'm talking about. You fill in the blank. There's, you fill in the blank. We're not going to argue about none of that. All right, so that's the class, and uh, we're going to take a little break. Thank you. So, welcome back, everybody. Just real quick, um, I know most people are either members or you already paid, but there's a donation bucket down there. If you didn't put in the 20 bucks suggested donation for the class, you could do that. And then also this, and make sure you tell your friends this, the money is of the least concern. The, the people coming for the knowledge is of the highest concern. So it's never about how much money you're going to contribute or what the ticket price is. That's just a, an added value so you feel that you're getting value because it could be $100 and it's still the same value, you know? It could be a million dollars or one dollar. So the donation thing's there if you want to contribute, if you're wealthy and you got something to give. But it's not, it's not a necessity. So tell your friends to come regardless of the, of the capital. And then also on top of that, if you're 20 years or younger, you're free anyway. You could tell everybody that too. So if you know people with, with teenagers, like I haven't really seen any teenagers come yet. So, um, how old are you, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Justin's been to almost every class too. And you could obviously tell that he's, a, he's a, got the Kindle soul, you know, which is, which is something that I feel more people have, but it has also been tuned out from our, uh, our consciousness as well. Um, yeah, so that's that about the donation. And then also I have a membership, which there's papers for over here. Um, and that's a three month commitment to the school at $45 a month. And you can renew that or stop doing it after three months, and that gets you into every class. And, and each month will have either two to four classes, is what I'm promising. So that's that. And I um, hope you enjoyed the food presentation. And here we have today is a special guest, John Balloon, good friend of mine. He's an elder in the community. He's a natural farmer for the last 40 plus years of his life. He's been on the Big Island for a good majority of that. And um, he's opened my mind to a lot of things about natural farming. He taught me how to plant pineapple. He, uh, I have, now I have a pineapple farm. You know, so it's, it's the things, the small things that the elders do that create <clears throat> bigger pictures to unfold. If John was stingy with that information, I wouldn't have a pineapple farm. I wouldn't, maybe we, maybe we didn't want to be here, you know? So it's all about sharing information. And, John's a wealth of it. Uh, he wants us to be interactive, ask questions. If we got him, um, uh, he's going to break down GMOs, the truth about GMOs, the truth about Roundup and gly glyphosate, glyphosate, however you say it. Gly but, um, glyphosate. Without further, <laughs> or glyphosate. Yeah. There's two John different kinds. Balloon. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I. Um, I've been trying to do this for about 20, 30 years. And back 20 years ago, we did the Millennium Garden series, and then we did workshops we called uh, Dancing with the Mother, because I really do believe we're not at war with Mother Nature. We're really in a, in a relationship with Mother Nature. And, uh, mud, and it comes out, we're dancing with Mother. We're not doing lead either. We're dancing with Mother, and she's leading us, OK? And it's a dance. To plant a garden is a dance. And uh, so we used to do workshops maybe 20 years ago, Millennium Garden Series, and I went all around and we, we did talks and we tried to be practical, to also give context, give history, because I really believe that we're almost out in the wilderness, all of us, once you, when, when your brain clicks on that, hey, wait, something's wrong here. You know, maybe the food shouldn't have pesticides all over, chemicals and poisons, and maybe I'm getting sick because of this problem. Maybe. My father had to get cancer problems because of this, or, you know, whatever clicks you on. I mean, I started going down the rabbit hole when I first got introduced, let's say, to biodynamic farming. And I was already involved in the ecological movement. I helped put on some of the first Earth Day celebrations back in the late 60s. 
uh, one in uh, Century City, California in the 70s, like March of 70. We put one, a big one on and then I hit it over here because I met um, elders and back then that was just when the environmental movement was taken over by corporate America. Before that the environmental movement was just small indigenous tribes, somebody with a, with a printing machine, a mimeograph machine we called them back then, just putting out flyers trying to turn people on to the plight of the whales or the oil spills or the different types of technology that were taking us over. This was only about 10 years after uh, the corporate America took over the uh, ag department basically after World War II and changed us from a small-scale farming world into corporate farming. Um, I try to give context to it, and so this is going to be more of a, a, a conversation because I don't know if we want to go practical. You know, what are you trying to grow? What should we do? What should we think about? So why don't we, st why don't we start from the basics and the way, I see, the way I see soil, okay? And interrupt me at any point if you've got a specific question or anything else. I, I look at soil in four different ways, okay? And uh, we can go down, we could do an, uh, 10 hours on each one of these ways and how it's been perverted by the uh, system. And the system, when I talk about the system, I'm talking about a system that is uh, printing pieces of paper and calling it money. And then putting a false value on everything that we own so they can buy and sell it. And over a span of uh, 100 years, they, they've perverted everyone's thoughts to money. So a piece of farmland, is it worth money? Is it worth our life? What's the price of a life? What's the price of a disease? What's the price of an illness? What's the price of contaminating the water if you're making $10 million? So it doesn't matter if 10, 15 people die. Who cares? You know, that's, that's just the cost. In fact, it helps our economic system because they're going to go to the hospital and 30, 40% of our economic system is health care. So the more people they get sick, you know, so I mean, we can go down every, any rabbit hole we want. So soil is basically looked at in four different ways, I believe. One is the physical, physicality of the soil, okay? So where are you? Are you on an island here? Are you in, the, are you in uh, Iowa? Or where are you, okay? What's the soil like, the physical properties of the soil? Is it rocky? Is it um, deep? Is it soft? Is it hard? Is it uh, high organic matter, low organic matter? Whatever it is, the physical things that you can actually perceive in the soil. Uh, it, can you stick your hand into the ground? When I, we had, I had gardens before the pigs got them, you know, I was always really happy. I could, just, I could literally just put my hand this deep down into my garden. Just like, and I'm sure you experience that. When you have a garden that you've created over, the ti over time and people are going, whoa, when most gardens are just in, like this almost, right? And, and then the history of this island and looking at, at how different kinds of trees can affect the physicality. Like the eucalyptus, when they put the eucalyptus on, we were fighting that like crazy. Give it to small farmers. No, we're going to do eucalyptus and we're going to sell them in 10 years, we're going to make all this money. Two growths of eucalyptus will turn that ground so hard you can't grow anything in it. Okay, and so now they, the eucalyptus, they weren't even able to sell it. That was a lie, right? It was basically uh, land banking where they just said, we're going to put eucalyptus, no one's ever going to farm it because they couldn't afford. This many people, we could change this whole island. If each one of us had a farm like Logan or my farm, and I used to, I've been saying this forever, right? We would change this island tomorrow. That's what we read from uh, to tomorrow. last week. So, 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 so the issue is the physicality of the soil. So, so one of the big fights that we had back in the 80s was they were trying to say, we're going to save agriculture, right? The, the government said. So we're going to identify prime agricultural lands and we're going to preserve those prime agricultural lands and we're going to let everything else be developed, right? So it turns out that all the Kona land wasn't prime because it was steep and it was rocky and it didn't have access to water. It didn't have access to roads. So that wasn't prime. So we could sell off all of Hono now, now, right? The only land that was valuable was the ones with deep, sort of deep soil that had, could get irrigation and electricity and stuff. And it was just ridiculous. It, they weren't saving agriculture. So that's the cane fields. Yeah, the, the cane fields and stuff like that, which are now toxic waste dumps if you really get into it. They, and, and then they, they said, oh yeah, maybe we'll do organics. I remember I was in on the discussion. Oahu had so they wanted to build houses now on the cane fields, but they weren't allowed to by the EPA because the, the amount of chemicals that were in the ground, they couldn't legally even put a house on it. So then they said, oh, we're going to open it up to organic farming for 10 years because they were hoping the organic farmer would just pollute himself. 
Well, hopefully, and then maybe they could, they'd fail, <laughs> they and they'd fail, obviously, because they weren't going to allow them to succeed, and then they could build their houses on it. So, they, so the, all the time, and I'm sorry you've seen this with KNF, they're paying lip service constantly, all the time, to any of the solutions that we're talking about today. And they aren't really solutions, and this is, I, I, even, I even buy into it. These aren't solutions. This is what the real at reality is. When conventional, they, they brought in conventional farming in 1950 in the United States, right after World War II, they took over, just like we see now, the university's been taken over by this far left communist agenda over the last 15 years, and it's just destroying education, destroying that. Well, that, that's a model they did to the ag departments back in the 50s, 48, 49, 50, when they took over all the ag departments, kicked out anyone that was into sustainable agriculture. If anyone wants to talk about the history and William Albrecht and the different soil scientists that had created a lot of the, the good science for agriculture and how they were pushed out to bring in this large-scale industrial farming that manifested in the, in the uh, late 60s with Earl Butts and Lyndon Johnson. Okay, But that's a whole other thing. So we have physicality of soil, right? What's the physical properties of the soil where you are? This governs what you can grow there, right? So if you have a soil that's rocky, maybe it's good for orchards. Okay, if you have a soil that's hard pan, maybe that's good for greenhouses or something. I mean, we start looking at place is very important with physicality. The big guys go, hey, I want a thousand acre farm. There could be 12 different physicalities on that. How do they do that? They just go in there and just bulldoze the whole thing. Just take it all out and boom, boom, bring in their chemicals and grow it. And then they create all these insect problems. That's what they did to Puna with papayas. Oh, we're going to grow, well, actually, papayas used to be grown in Kona, okay? When I first got here, they were starting to abandon the fields because of what we called the virus, okay? And it wasn't really that bad because I actually had, at that point, I wanted to be a, a forager. I didn't want to be a farmer. I was coming from, from the mainland. I got here in uh, early 71. And I thought farming, because it had been taken over, was the most evil thing ever. I didn't want to be a farmer. So I actually hooked up with old papaya growers, and I would glean their fields, and I would pick papayas, because they were, they were all moving to Pune, where the virus wasn't there. The, the virus that I'm talking about is the original ring mosaic ring spot virus. The, the one they genetically modified the trees for, they actually released a different virus that they'd already genetically modified a papaya to be against, because they couldn't do the one for here. So they actually introduced another virus to force us with the one that he said that it was completely turned around. It was totally criminal. Okay, I watched this whole thing happen, and I, I was fighting it. That's, 95 is when I really got into the whole GMO thing. And if you guys want to go into the specifics of what GMOs are really about, we'll do that too. So we got the physicality of the soil, okay? And then you have the chemical part of the soil, right, which would be the pH. What are the, what are the minerals that are in the soil, okay? What's the relationship of calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus, tr uh, my, uh, trace elements? We have, so we have macronutrients, right, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. And we have the, um, the macronutrients, which would be the calcium and the, and the magnesium and, and all the other ones that, that we kind of see in fertilizer bags. Then you have the trace elements, which they only are starting to admit to now. You know, they're really super traces. Um, and how they're in there, the pH of the soil, and, and, and so those are, are controlled with chemicals, right, obviously. Now, now the uh, proponent, when uh, the chemical theory came out. It was a guy named Liebig, I think, Justice von Liebig. And he was actually a pretty incredible scientist. And he identified that to grow healthy plants, we need nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Okay, and, or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. NPK. Everyone's heard about NPK. And that basically, most, the rule of thumb is about 80 pounds of each per year to grow a crop. Okay? So 80 pounds of nitrogen, 80 pounds of potassium. 80, these chemical guys look at it. In Kona, they do it by the rain gauge because they've turned all those nutrients into soluble nutrients. And so every 10 inches they got to put out NPK because 80% of it's just washing off into the ocean, okay? Creating externality. So we can go in down and down that rabbit hole if you want. So interestingly enough, when Liebig came out with this theory, he said, yeah, these are nitrogen, potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus, NPK are, are what we need. But then he said, but we need all these other little things, the calcium and the this, to balance it. He was, it was very controlled. The chemi guys got a hold of it, and they just took out three quarters of his thesis and threw it away. 
They thanked him very much for his idea. They came in with their chemical NPK and they got incredible yields for a year or two. And now in his theory, he said, you're going to, with these soluble fertilizers, you're going to basically start destroying the biology of the soil. You're going to destroy the, the, the physicality of the soil. You're going, to just, you're going to take out the trace elements of the soil, so you're going to have to actually add more NPK every year. So he protested, and they literally, I, I think the story on him is he ended up in a mental institution. And they ended up killing him to keep him quiet, because they were making so much money just going into sort of unfertile areas and growing crops for money. And, and the amount of chemicals increased, 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 which actually is creating a problem now. We all heard about peak oil, right? But there is something called peak phosphorus and peak potassium. Mm. Turns out that when we do natural growing, and we're actually trying to make money, which is, which is the next step, because right now we're, we're talking subsistence, but the next step is actually is to try to make some money, right? Sometimes we have to use it. Ex, you know, in, we have to bring stuff in from the farm. We have to put a little extra phosphorus out, a little extra nitrogen. In a natural system, we use one-tenth at the most of what a conventional guy to get the same exact results, okay? And I'll get to that, why, why that's like that. So the, the chemical guys, you get rid of nature, you gotta buy the chemicals. Most of your profit now is going to the chemical guys. We're now slaves or serfs to the chemical industry, right? By, because we bought into this chemical thing, and every year, that, oh, now they're addicted. Go try to explain to a, a farmer oh, you can't use your triple 16 and you can't use your... And he'll freak out just like a heroin addict if you took his heroin away from him. They are chemically addicted. It, 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 it's an absolute addiction. And, and it, 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 it's sad to watch. Okay, so then we got that. And now we get to the KNF part of it, which is, which is where, where the rabbit hole began for me was with biodynamics. I took a class in biodynamic farming when I was about 21, 22 at Pierce College and mind-blowing, okay? Whereas KNF, I, I'm imagining all you guys know about KNF and the rice and the capturing of the microbes, okay? A lot of the students have been to the KNF course, okay. not everyone. So, so Rudolf Steiner was a mystic, and, and, and he didn't believe in the germ theory. He really looked at it as, as viruses were, were eliminated. We eliminated stuff. Um, okay, all, about all right. Um, and he captured his organisms, right, by sticking manure in a cow horn right. and burying it. And like, like uh, fermented juices for vegetable juices, he would also, he had seven or eight herbs that he would put in the cow so, horn. So and silica and stuff like that. Quick, yeah. When you, when you explain biodynamic to a, a regular group of people, they, they shroud it in mysticism and all this weird stuff. What he just laid down, he didn't say it in mysticism, he said it in biologics. He said that he put they put the manure, the herbal juices into a cow horn for what? For well, uh, the, by a specific for a few months by the specific sign of the moon, depending on what they were doing. For, and then they would cat they would capture those microbes. Then right. they would take that and they so would mix it in water, energize it to maintain peak <coughs> microbiology through a season because these horns would be buried under the snowpack. Right where they're not getting frozen right. and they're staying alive. So as soon as spring comes around, you unbury the horn, you make a compost tea. Now you got, remember that we talked about the ratio, 60% good guy and neutral. Well, now we got our, our, our fermented good guys yeah. to make a tea and start spraying. Right when spring hits, bam, all our neutral microbes when the snow melts are now gonna go good. And now we got a fertile farm. No mysticism. No, and but now, now you got to remember that you don't Steiner started out a little mystical because, super mystical, yeah, and, and because because, because he looked at it as bringing in the forces of nature. So when we're talking about funguses and viruses and and, and beneficial organisms, he was talking about entities. Right. Okay, same and thing. then and then along it's exactly the same thing. And then a man named Enric Pfeiffer came along in the 50s, 40s or 50s and went, wait a second. That's 50, you have, every time I bury that horn, I pull it, I get 52, 54, 60 specific beneficial organisms. He broke it down, okay? And then they started, then they did quality control. Now you can get your field sprays and you can get all this with those organisms. And then there was uh, 
all these different composts that have built off all out of that where you guys are getting different cultures and stuff like that. So my, my farm was inoculated with biodynamic fuel spray immediately. The breakdown is amazing. When you come up to the farm, there's, they're just ama it's amazing how quickly things break down. It's just, it's just really unbelievable. And so, uh, that, so that's the biology, right? And so what else does the biology do, okay? Feed the soil, feed the plant. We have uh, at least 50, probably hundreds of different organisms that are eating each other. A fungus will eat a bacteria, a bacteria will eat a fungus. Eventually it's eaten by a protozoa that when it poops out, it poops out some little bit of nitrogen that'll be picked up by a, a bacteria that lives out on the outside of a root called uh, mycorrhizal bacteria, which then uh, connects with, it's an ecto, which is an outside, connects with a bacteria that's inside the root. And, and it feeds that, and eventually that, that fertilizer and those, those minerals and those uh, so gets into the plant. Now, the, what happens in a biological system <clears throat> is these bacteria take the nitrates and take the phosphates and take all these different things and change them and eventually turn them into proteins and substances that can be used by the plant and create nutrient-dense food. In a chemical system, you're, you're adding soluble stuff, which is one, destroying soil matter. The soluble stuff is also killing soil bacteria. They're not worried about that. They're, they're destroying the tilth of the soil. Now the soil is tight, which means that it repels water or the water runs through it too quickly. Then you have irrigation problems and you get one way or the other. All these problems are then created. Oh, now I have a fungus problem because the water is too much. Now you come in with another chemical to kill the fungus and the fungus side goes down into the ground and kills another soil bacteria, which creates that bacteria was the one that was turning the nitrates into protein for the plant. And now you're not getting, it's not green enough. Oh, you have a nitrogen deficiency. And the nitrogen deficiency then is exacerbated by an acidic condition, which is now allowing aluminum to come up into the ground, right? And, which, and alumina is fine. It's, it makes clay and stuff like that. There's nothing wrong with aluminum, but when you have highly acidic soil, now you've got yellowing, and now we've got to come in with more nitrogen fertilizer to get that to pop up. I did some, cons some consulting for a guy down by the ocean, and he had a tomato farm. He was having a hell of a time, and we're just going, man, you've got a phosphate problem. You just don't have any phosphate uptake. So his choice was literally, and it's hard to believe, he would buy phosphate in the big tanks that they would use phosphoric acid that they would, you know, inject, they would make uh, Coca-Cola with and stuff like that. So it was a big pressurized tank of phosphoric acid and he would spike phosphoric acid into the soil, into the soil to try to get his tomatoes grow. Soil. What? Soil grown or hydroponic? Well, it's soil grown. It's tempting. And then we said, no, this is, you're crazy. You're a nut because the phosphate in the acidic condition binds with aluminum. It creates aluminum phosphate and it's just, it doesn't, hardly gets anything. And he's right by the ocean. All that phosph extra phosphate's killing the Kealakua Bay. And we're trying to explain this to him. He says, okay, 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 I, I, I give up. So he went and got chicken manure. So, so three months later, we go out. He says, There's, nothing's working. Nothing. Literally, and no one, you guys will believe me, but no one believes me. I went out there and it was like the chicken manure had just been taken out of the package. It was on the ground. It was so dead. It was like you could pick it up and it smelled like chicken manure that you'd buy at Ace Hardware. It wasn't, it, wasn't it was just whatever that stuff you buy in, in the thing. It was just unbelievable. And this guy was trying to grow. Eventually he turned it into an orchid farm or something like that. I don't know. So that's the biology, right? And so that's what we're trying to work on here. The biology, you bring in the organic matter, a lot of your problems go away because the, the soil has, a, has an intelligence to do that. But where I'm coming from now in my, in, 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 in my progression is, is a spiritual quality also to growing. Okay, and it's the Divine Mother, it's, it's, it's the consciousness of this planet, I don't know, however you guys want to look at it, God, or whatever it is. But to make a connection with life, to make connection with the Divine Mother, is the grace of farming. Because if you have problems, if you have any mental problems, you have spiritual problems, you get your hands in the ground. I know, I know when I was started my farm, I didn't really know any Hawaiians, I just started growing taro and I started doing this and I met Kanaka and they were and I said, yeah, it's your land. Anytime you need put taro, come up and get it. Anytime you want to graze, it's your place. And I was friends with these guys for years. And one of his, they brought another guy up. And the guy's going, wow, what an amazing farm. How did you figure it out? And my other friend said, he never figured out the the Aina taught him. The Divine Mother taught you. There's downloads that come. You get your hands in the ground. 
And we can look at it scientifically, whether it's the Schumann resonance or the vibration or the, or, or the earthing or the microbes. connection, all of it. Oh, you know, the microbes that you get in your, you put in your mouth now or in your gut. I mean, there's so many different ways to look at it, but, but it's a really an opportunity for a spiritual experience, for the downloads. The intellectual downloads, the spiritual downloads, the what you've been missing, okay? And so that's how we make our connection. And there, there's a lady named Anastasia Sasia. You heard about that, the Ringing Cedars lady from, from Russia? And she talks about it, how, how food is there to become our medicine. And she puts the seeds in her mouth and she has all these different techniques. It's, 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 I just love, love her concepts and stuff like that. And so that's the spiritual aspect. And this is really why we do what we do. Okay. Besides feeding ourselves and being sovereign human beings and being responsible for our life and, 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 and taking control of our own health, con taking control of our, our, our na you know, and all of a sudden now, I was ta talking about this earlier with, with Julio, is in a chemi world, we, you know, I'd be growing my farm and my neighbor would be, and I'd be going, oh, wow, I got, my farm's got to look better than his farm. I'm not going to tell him that, boy, if, oh, it's so funny, look at that idiot, he's mulching with that wrong thing, ha, 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 you know. But in, in, in our world, we would go, hey, man, maybe you should uh, compost that mulch before you put it out and really help you out. Maybe with some of this yeah. tea. Right. right, exactly, right exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. And so, so there's a different consciousness that we're trying to develop here. And it's called community. It's like reality. This is how we have been as human beings, okay? So, so we have these components uh, 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 of farming. Is there any questions? Does anyone want me to go in any other direction or anything? Is anybody? No? I like the direction you're going. Okay. At, at some time, I'm interested. What? At some time, the Do it. World War II and the history, I would be interested. At some time. It doesn't have to be now. Okay. Well, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to that because that, that gets that's a very deep rabbit hole. You that would be. Pass around your what? Book while you talk, that one, the, the oh yeah, you know, you guys are welcome to look at this one. This is the this is the Dancing with the Mother workshop book that we did. It's a compilation of all kinds of stuff, and in the middle of it is a actually a growing guide, right here that I that I created. So I'll just pass this around. And this is 20 years old, and I think I've upgraded it. I just don't have it with me right now. It's in, in my computer somewhere. But this is uh, a growing guide in the middle of it. But um, it basically talks about almost everything we're going to be talking about here. Is that how to look at insects and how to look at this and what you're growing right, and you different crops and stuff like that. And yeah. Without cancer. And it's based on amagladin, which we were talking about. Um, B17, the vitamin B17 that's in cassava. And uh, one of the reasons that, that, that people have, that have sickle cell anemia have a problem with sickle cell is they're not eating cassava because when they eat the cassava, it actually, they can ab absorb, they don't go hypoxic. They, they, they can actually absorb more oxygen and actually is good for us, okay, because of the, uh, the vitamin. And it's the, one of the cures for cancer that was actually made illegal back in the, in the 80s. It made it illegal for you to take vitamin B17 yeah, for cancer. Of, one of the, the <coughs> scientists that found that out got murdered. Yeah, yeah. It's very, very, very bizarre. And so this, this is the book that we could actually answer a lot of your questions. There's the whole, half the book is the vast health conspiracy since World War, since actually uh, turn of the century with Rockefeller and the takeover of our medical system and agricultural system. It all happened kind of in, in tandem. Okay, I just yeah, brought that so book. Yeah, I thought it might be an interesting book. Rothschild. Yeah, so that's like that might be interesting. Like Rockefeller, Rothschild, yeah. like uh, hospital system, yeah. schooling system, yeah. banking system. So, so and, uh, you can prove that. And then another book I brought is called An Agricultural Testament by a guy named Sir Albert Howard, who was probably the original organic guy. And he really liked small scale farming. If you had a cow, he would actually collect their urine and then collect their mite and, and, and use that as a composted fertilizers and stuff like that. And he actually, um, inspiration to almost everybody. Sir Albert Howard is, is you know, I'm really going for the old guys out here, okay, just to show you the roots of it, cause to understand that, again, this isn't a solution to a problem. This is, let's get back to the roots of the problem, okay, which is, the, which is they cut us off at the roots. If all this stuff would have evolved for the last hundred years, right. we'd have peace on earth. We'd have peace on earth right now. There'd be no doubt about it. And in fact, there was a book written in 1890 that peace on earth had arrived. And, and, and what had brought the peace on earth? And, and, and it's kind of counterintuitive. 
the, two, two things were invented in the eight, late 1800s, 1870s, 1880s, was internal combustion engine and the, diesel, and the diesel engine. Now how would that bring peace on Earth? Because the internal combustion engine and the diesel engine were both created to be run on the diesel peanut oil, and the internal combustion engine was alcohol. Both basically byproducts of farming. Wow. Okay, most of the economic catastrophes that happen, and we can get into parity agriculture. I brought a lot of stuff from the 70s or 80s talking about parity agriculture and stuff like that. But basically what happens is booms and busts would occur. Money was tied to the price of commodities, the price of farm was, was how good was the crop. The crop was just perfect, plenty of money flow through the system, everything was good, everyone was great. It wasn't enough. If it was droughts, people would be starving, there wouldn't be enough money flowing through the system, and there'd be economic catastrophe, recessions, and horrible things. If they grew a bumper crop, now the farmers were screwed. Everybody else was doing good. The prices came down so much that eventually the farmers would go out of business, which would eventually lead to a problem. But with the advent of the internal combustion engine and the reality of the diesel engine that they could uh, generate electricity, they could, they could make threshing machines, they could become a little bit more uh, efficient, uh, every, every home, every farm had, a, had an electrical generator by 1890, 18, you know, and then they figured out cities and hydroelectric and all that, but, but originally it was all kind of... So the byproduct of peanut oil and alcohol being combusted is... Is, is basically the surpluses were now immediately well, needed, but there's no, but there's no so there would never be a surplus. Produced? Mm -mm, well, you know, not, not horribly because basically the alcohol was, was, was you had too much grain or you had your waste fruit or you had this, you turned it into alcohol. Like if we were running that, like, a, like you're not dealing with a bunch of, uh, of carcinogens being released. No, you're not. No, it's as clean as it gets. It's as clean as a biofuel, but you're not growing the biofuel to not do food. Right. It's, it's basically taking the surplus that year. Okay, now you're more efficient. Now the farmer has a surplus. The, the weird thing about ec economy, which is another whole 10 hours of, uh, of agricultural economy, it's called parity or uh, basically raw, the proper util utilization of raw materials. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you in a nutshell. Uh, an economist named Carl Wilkin basically said, what is all these booms and busts and what's all that? And he looked at the 1890 thing, peace on earth, because now there weren't going to be any more surpluses with farm commodities. Now we're going to be able to build the industrial revolution on a small scale because everyone will have a still, everyone will have an energy generating source, they'll have the electricity, they'll be more efficient, the farms will be more efficient. And like uh, Logan was saying, a very high percentage of people were farmers. So that just meant great things, you know, by by um, before World War II, I think it was one in six people were actual farmers, were actually growing food. After World War II, maybe one in eight, one in 10, 1950, one in 10, 1960, one in 20. Now, actually people growing food is one in 200, I think. One in 200. One in 200, actually out there growing food. Okay. Is that like small gardeners, like guys? Not, not counting so small gardens. I'm talking, I'm talking about okay. production for, for, for people. One in, one in 200. Okay, it used to be one in eight. It, it okay. Was one in three. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, you keep on going back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just yeah, saying. It's just like breathing. Yeah, yeah. You're just farming and breathing. And so you have the situation of, of, um, this wasn't allowed to happen. And that's why I'm going to where you're going. That's why World War I was created. Why was, there's nobody on this planet that'll ever tell you why World War I was ever fought, okay? It was manufactured by the elitists, just like they manufactured this virus. Look how quickly they did it with all the cell phones and all the knowledge and all us smart people and stuff. Look how they did it to us in six months. World War II took about 20 years for them to do that, okay? And, and basically they, they made it look like it was biblical prophecy so they could bring back false Christianity, false Judaism, whatever you want to talk about it, all the major religions. They, 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 they made it look like biblical prophecy, it looked like the end of the world was coming. We had to get right, we had to get rid of sin. What was the number one sin in 1905 in this world? Alcohol. Drinking alcohol. Drunks. So that's how they got the, the amendment put in to, to ban prohibition of alcohol. It was going to save us. It was a million dollars given to the prohibitionists by, by Rockefeller, who was trying to promote what he had just discovered was synthetic alcohol. 
called gasoline. There was a progression with the alcohol. First, the oil was sold as a, as a tonic. They actually drank alcohol. Uh, uh, Rockefeller made his first money selling oil as a, as a health tonic. It was called snake oil, and he made millions of dollars selling it as a health oil. <laughs> and then they turned it into kerosene, which supplanted the whale oil. So all the whalers, all the despicable people that were just destroying whales, they put the boats aside, and they got into the oil business making kerosene for lights. And then, they, then by 1915, 1910, they discovered, I don't know the exact numbers, but then they discovered uh, catalytic cracking and, and, and certain kinds of things to make gasoline. And they tried to sell that to the American farmers and the American people around them. They said, why do we want that? We got our alcohol still in the backyard. We're doing it, the gasoline, we can't even drink it. We spill it, it hurts, we, it blows up if we do something wrong. It was like, no way we're ever gonna do that. And Rockefeller was like, no, well, I think of a way. I mean, we'll have World War I. And so World War I just broke it all apart. Everybody, we also had prohibition. 90% of the stills in the United States were fuel stills, were, were for fuel. They were, they were covered in prohibition. So when you see those pictures of them breaking down stills, that wasn't meth labs they were breaking. They were breaking down people's fuel oh in their backyard. They weren't even drinking that stuff, okay? And so now we had World War I, everything's dislocated, and they had cheap gasoline, and they went, well, thank you. And then they brought in rural electrification in the United States, which was basically damming up all the fertile valleys getting rid of all the small-scale farmers, beginning the, the process of getting rid of all the indigenous people for, for electricity, and that was called rural electrification. It was gonna help everybody. All the whole Southeast was destroyed over that. And we talk about hemp. Hemp had a lot to do with that also, and the, the making of hemp illegal because the softwoods that they were growing uh, didn't need to be grown in the South because hemp could have been the paper source and all of that, but really hemp or marijuana was made illegal because that was part of their agenda of creating famine around the world. Because 90% because of the marijuana or hemp or whatever cannabis grown was for food. And that was why when the United Nations was created after World War II, if you wanted to be part of the United Nations, you wanted to rebuild your country, you need to get loans from the IMF, right, which was the Bank of the United Nations. Like the, like the national, like the uh, World Health Organization is the uh, health arm, okay? So if a country said, said, okay, you want to borrow money from the United Nations? Okay, you got to join the United Nations, okay? And what's the number first thing to join the United Nations? Eradicate marijuana off your country. Wow. If you wanted to borrow money to rebuild your country that had been destroyed because foreign powers came and decided due to a proxy war on your place, you, had not, you didn't even have a dog in that fight. But they went into your indigenous country and they fought their war, destroyed you, and then they said you had to get rid of the one thing you could grow in three months that could feed you to borrow the money to rebuild your agriculture. And they said, don't worry about it, we'll give you the grain. What's the grain they gave you? They gave you processed, brominated, you know, when they talk about uh, bleached white flour, that's bromine and chlorine. And what do they do? They tax your penile gland. It calcifies your penile gland. It takes you, a, a further disconnects you from nature, the spiritual aspect of ourselves. So we forced, boom, after World War II, we just forced, it took from World War I to World War II to finish this. World War II was just a continuation. To just eliminate it, boom. Now, we could have sent them a container of hemp seed, thrown it out, and the people would have been eating for the rest of their lives. They had to send thousands of containers of moldy grain. You know, so I don't know. You know, this is the way I look at it. Maybe, that's, you know, maybe I'm an idiot, but I don't know. So that's, you know, World War II, it's all manipulation. All these wars are all bankers' wars. They're all, they're, there's never a war been fought that had anything to do with the reality of what the history is sent telling us. So now we're here in Hawaii, okay? So I don't know, anyone else got another question? Okay, uh, let's, let's keep on, you, before we, you were talking yeah. about, uh, you said the foundation is soil for farming. Oh yeah, okay, you all right. You kind of maybe continue? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so let's, let's get a little more practical, okay? So we're, we're in Hawaii. Okay, so what was the history of Hawaii? So when, when you get to a farm, when I look at a farm, when I used to do consulting and stuff, it's really, the, the, this, this place has been manipulated so horribly. I mean, it, it, especially when the Amazon was burning, I tried to uh, reason with some friends and I got a lot, lot of heat over it. But what's, what's happening in the Amazon now happened here 100 years ago, okay? All the rainforests were destroyed, 
Okay, all of the ohias were cut down, almost all of them. Those are the railroad tides that they used to build the Transcontinental Railroad. All of, because they had no hardwoods in California. So they, they just cut down the ohia forest while they were taking out all the sandalwood. The ohia all went to California. All of the foods grown in Maui and the fertile valleys there were all sent to San Francisco for the gold rush. We fed the entire United States from here because they didn't have a railroads. They didn't have, they couldn't move grain around and stuff like that. So it all went to there. We, we, our history is very, very amazing, okay? So they destroyed the rainforest here. Okay, they destroyed, literally destroyed Hawaii on a lot of levels. So now we're here, we're recapturing, you know, the gusto, you know, because the nature is amazing and it's reclothing itself. So we have a situation here where we have a lot of different environments, a lot of micro environments. We have deep soil, we have rocky soil, we have uh, acidic soil, we have uh, the soils around Kealakua Bay are actually prime. I mean, they're, they're not acidic at all. They're really highly calcified, incredible soil. In fact, that was, that was really where the breadbasket of, of Kona and Kau. This is why Kona and Kau stayed sovereign even from Kamehameha. Yeah, that was where but they had breadfruits and they had sweet potato, a lot of sweet potato. They had a lot of stuff. And so by Kamehameha, you know, we got I look at Hawaiian history a little different. And if there's Kanaka here that take exception with what I'm saying. I've, I was taught this by Sovereign Kanaka, okay? So this is what I'm saying is this. Kamehameha was created by the British, just like Saddam Hussein was created by the Americans. The whole history of Kamehameha was all perversion, all created, because Hawaiians were all oral tradition. So when they started writing down the history of Kamehameha, they just made it up. They, they made up that he was put in a canoe because there was going to be a king and he was saved. That was the Moses myth. He was going to move the stone. He was going to be the king. That was the King Arthur pulled the sword out of the stone myth. Uh, not to interrupt, but just yeah. real quick, I got a book that lays out how to create a king. Yeah. It's a book, an old book, it's all about that, and it goes okay. word for word with commandments. Yeah, 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 okay. So, so, so we have this situation where Kamehameha broke all the kapus, right, they say, which sounds great, oh yeah, but what he did is he basically took away the guides for living, which were the intuitive ways to live on the island. Those were the kapus, how things were eaten, how things were done, how you fished, how you did this. That was all broken and then replaced with authoritarian Christianity, okay? Uh, which was a manipulative political religion at that point. I, I mean, I'm a Christian, to tell you the truth. I and mean, I really do believe Jesus Christ lives inside of me, okay? And I'm going to leave it like that. And I don't want to get into it. But it's like God lives inside me. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, whatever you're dealing with, you can deal with it. But, but, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so by, by the, so Kamehameha broke when he died. And then we actually start seeing, so even the pictures of Kamehameha were all created. Okay, there was a, two or three artists over here, and that was it. If they can lie to us about Vietnam, and they can lie to us with thousands of embedded uh, journalists, and all those lies, 9-11, all of these things we've all been lied to, one or two guys who drew pictures right. could lie to us, okay? <laughs> so, so, so Kamehameha, all the pictures you see of Kamehameha were just, uh, were actually warriors that Kamehameha picked out of the thing and, and put in chains and sent to England to have the pictures made, okay? So he was, whatever he was, he was, okay? But wasn't a really nice person. So by the time Kamehameha III came along, they were just a proxy for Britain, okay? The Captain Vancouver came over here and they said, okay, this is not good. We killed off 90% of the Hawaiians. They're starting to regrow their fields. They got their food going on. They really don't want anything to do with us. What are we gonna do? That was, we look at the backstory of Kamehameha III. A lot of people revere him. So Vancouver came over here and really, and I hate to say this, but, but Kamehameha III was Vancouver's uh, beach or whatever you want to call it. And, and Vancouver said, oh, we're going to release cattle because you guys are so starving and we're going to save you. And so everyone goes, yeah, well, that's why the cattle were here and that's why they denuded the forest and they, that was to feed the Hawaiians. But he had one caveat. You can't touch the cattle for 10 years. Okay? He put a kapu on it. He put a kapu on it. 10 years. Cattle were doubling every 10 years. Every, every year. Less than a year. They make way more. By 10 years, this place was overrunning cattle. And what did they say? And what did the cattle... Have you ever had a cow on your farm in a breadfruit tree? They'll eat it down into the ground. The native food sources. The, the taro, the this, the, the sweet potatoes, the pigs, the taro. All of the food was gone. 
And then the Hawaii, a few Hawaiians that were left were saying, save us, what are we going to do now? We can't eat the cattle, we can't... And then the, that's when the, the uh, local ranchers came along and the, and the priest said, oh, don't worry, we can put fences up. And the Hawaiians said, oh, great. So they put fences up everywhere and now they had their little taro patches safe. And the Hawaiians said, oh, wait, I got to go get that piece of koa for my canoe. And he climbs over the fence. No. You can't go up there, why? He says, it's a fence. See, that's yours and this is mine. And that's how they stole all the land for, from the Hawaiians, basically. Okay, it was all, I don't know if it's good intentions or bad intentions or whatever. And that's where we're at now, okay? So what can we grow here? What can we grow here? Okay. Um, on rocky land, orchard crops are great. Okay, avocados, mangoes, depending on elevation, coffee, great commodity crop. Coffee's a good food. You can eat the beans, you know? You can eat those red beans and eat them. It's just a, just a beans, protein. Like cook them, you mean? No, you just eat them raw. Green? No, you red. Nice red. and red. Oh, Lop them in your mouth them. and just chew them. Just chew them right up. They're, they're great. Great food. Now, the thing is, is we have high rainfall. Now, how do you ha and what's the problem people don't understand? When you have high rainfall and you're growing protein, what's deficient? People don't realize. It's kind of counterintuitive because we have a sulfur belching volcano, but sulfur is super important. So a lot of times you want to get good fruit over here, you might need a little bit extra potassium sulfate because sulfate helps build protein. So you want a good crop. You want to get that protein, those beans, those things looking good. The cacao really needs potassium, but also sulfur is really important, okay? Just as a little, little side note. So then what happened with the evolution of this place? So they brought in, they took out all the ohia, right? Then they, then they basically went in with their uh, big draft animals and, and, and steal stuff and they said, oh, those Hawaiians are still growing their taro down there. What are we going to do? And they realized the way the water systems work, they could just break the lava tubes. They could just go above where they want to put in their sugar cane or they want to put in some other crop and they, they just kept going back and forth till they hit that lava tube and they stopped the spring from right. down in Hokena or stopped the spring down at the old airport or, or, or the new airport or any of the coastlines. They took out all the coconuts that were along here, all the self-sufficiency. It was all gone. Well, yeah, I, I'm getting to that point too, but um, I don't know if the word believe in evil is, is the way I would look at it, but um, so now we have a situation where the island has been screwed up. I mean, uh, there's a lot of that. Mango Court was one of the largest artesian wells in the Pacific. It took 10 or 12 dump trucks of uh, big cement trucks to cap it when they put in Hokulia down there. They just took out the, the most involved field system in the world, tropical field system in the volcanic areas was right in this coastline right here. The most highly evolved. They had underground uh, wells, they had air wells where they brought air down into lava tubes and had literally had water underground, uh, acre lakes underneath the ground that were all destroyed when they put in Hokulia. Just still one in Kyoto. There, is there one? I don't know. Underground? Yeah, under, there's, you take the road down right before the yeah. division, and that's that, that gated little It's area. still sort of there? And I've seen a show on it, and they, you drive down underground. It's, the, oh, it's still there. Down okay, it was like, really big right down here. It was, yeah, and, that, and it fed the water. water source. That, that, yeah, that might even, yeah. they, they left that one alone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what, what are we doing? So what are we doing? So anybody that's going to get a farm here has got a farm that was probably ohia, breadfruit, kukui nut, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, forest that's been taken off, right? So, so remember, when they take these, these, these things off, they're not just taking it off and now we've got, what did they take off? Fertility, fertility is created by these trees growing and dropping their limbs and their leaves. They're taking off all these minerals. All the minerals, all the basis of future fertility is now gone, right? And now that has to build up. Now, now what did they bring in? I think they started with cattle, pasture. I think they did sugar cane. They did all these things which were all extractive agricultural stuff. Oranges and bees. What? Oranges and bees. They had oranges over here? Cattle came with oranges and bees. Oh. And stuff. Or Hogulia. Yeah. If you go down there, all those orange trees supposedly came with Vancouver. That was Vancouver. Yeah, that was, that, the Vancouver orange. Yeah, that, he went around and planted uh, oranges everywhere on that. But, but not in you know, Kiavi. The stickers to keep people away. Keep a, well, the Kiavi was put in to, to force the Hawaiians to start putting on shoes and clothes and stuff like that. And also fed the cattle and stuff like that. Get them off the coastline. 
But so what do we have to do? So we have a demineralized tropical soil that's been completely wasted. It's zippa soil, it's a very fragile soil. So the universities came in in the 40s over here and they didn't look at it as a tropical soil. This is a rainforest over here. They, they wanted to go, oh, this is California. And they took all of the science of growing something in California to grow here. So what did they do? Topsoil is gone. Amazing fertility here for the first year or two. I don't care who you are, you go up to a piece of property here in Hawaii, you open it up, and you're going to be the smartest farmer that ever lived for about a year. Maybe two years. Okay? And then the shit's going to hit the fan. And then if, if you're not ahead of it, you're, you're going to be going back to the mainland with your tail behind. You know, you're going to go, ah, that's, Hawaii sucks. Okay? It's getting harder and harder now, though, than ever before. And you know why? It's called glyphosate. Okay? Glyphosate, Roundup, there's two forms of it. Okay. There's glyphosate, which was created basically, okay, it was originally patented as a chelating agent in the chemical world, okay, because it has an, it has an ability to uh, hold on to minerals, specifically manganese, iron, and calcium, okay? The way it kills is photosynthesis, we all know what photosynthesis is, right? We've all been educated. It's car carbon dioxide and water come together with a little bit of sunlight and we have sugars, right? But it's a little more, it's about 12 different things all those things have to go through. And it requires certain enzymes and certain other minerals and stuff. And one of the major minerals, magnesium, chlorophyll, right? We have chlorophyll. Right? You know what chlorophyll is? This is where photosynthesis takes place. It's basically a magnesium molecule, a, ma a molecule of magnesium surrounded by a, a basically a matrix. It's, it's amazing, amazing fractal kind of matrix of organic material, okay? A kind of surround of chemicals or whatever it is. And that's the chlorophyll molecule, okay? The, the amazing part of it is if we look at hemoglobin, which is our blood, it, has ex it looks exactly the same as chlorophyll, except in the middle is, is, an, is an iron molecule. Okay? They're exactly to a, uh, to a magnesium, magnesium. magnesium molecule. So there's, a, there's something kind of, you know, spiritual in that concept, right? And then there was a guy named Louis Curvan who actually believed and called the transmutation of the elements is that you could eat a chlorophyll molecule right. and, and the physicality of our body, the biophysical out can change that magnesium molecule to iron. So you don't break down the chlorophyll and turn it back into, magne into, into right. blood. It actually, your body can take that chlorophyll and turn it into... into in, seconds. He probably says yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, so where, where are we at now? I'm going... Uh, I don't know. Okay, glyphosate. Okay, okay. So glyphosate was a chelator, industrial chelator. <coughs> and then they discovered that if it got on a plant, right, obviously somebody's dropped it and the plant died. And they went, wow, this is great, herbicide, wow. Then they looked at it and it only affected, they, they looked at it, what did it do? Does it affect people? They would drink it and they would do all that. You know, they would give it to probably black people and poor people and people in prison. And they didn't right, die right away and they went, oh, that's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. And then they scientifically said, oh, it only disrupts the plant because of the shigametic pathway. They talked about that, which is, because it chelates, it hurts the bio of uh, certain microorganisms. Unfortunately, it's a coral reefs ha have that pathway. A lot of a lot of very important stuff, soil bacteria, biology, all of that has that stuff. In fact, it killed everything, right? But how does it kill a plant? Which is what I'm getting to. Why it's so much more difficult? What? What's that? It does it on a hormonal basis. Well, it does. It does it on a lot of different bases. But what happens is it makes the plant so sick that the plant is now susceptible to every possible disease a plant I can get. It made the plant grow so fast. No, that it no, almost killed no. That that's more of a 2,4-D thing. What you're talking about is 2,4-D. Okay. That's the theory on the 2,4-D. Okay, that's something else. But the glyph what happens now is you get a plant. It just doesn't die. It's now in death throes for a few weeks. Because you notice, the guy sprays and the plant kind of looks weird for a few days and you go, wait a sec. And it's, it, I, I especially know this, I'll wake up in the morning and I'll go, oh God, I'm going to get sick. And especially with the coronavirus, we were so worried. Like, like a week ago, I went, oh, I'm getting sick. So I took my uh, grapefruit seed extract and zinc because the grapefruit seed extract has a lot of quinine in it and zinc together can knock anything out of your body. It's really great. It's kind of organic hydrochloroquine. And so I would do that and I'd feel a little bit better. And then I'd go down because I had been up in my house 
And I realized that the day I started feeling sick was the day my neighbor had sprayed Roundup all over the place, right? That's an externality. Remember, I got sick. I lost a day. I paid for that. He made the profit by not having to do that. So I'm subsidizing my neighbor now, okay? Direct subsidi I'm directly subsidizing my neighbor now for his use of glyphosate. Okay, now there's another, another one called glyphosinate, which they call finale, which, which at, when people got wind of glyphosate, um, Syngenta, which is Monsanto, was Mon this is Monsanto and Syngenta are the two biochemical genetically modified people. They also have a genetically modified pl plant for, for glyphosinate. It's called Finale and they sold to everybody as a natural glyphosate, but it was exactly the same. It just had one little tweak thing, so it was glyphosinate. So what happens is your neighbor's now spraying his weeds. Now you're, those weeds now, it's called a reservoir of uh, uh, we want to call bad, bad organisms, right? So now the, the, you have a, a reservoir of anthracnose, phytophthora, every kind of virus, every kind of bacterial wilt, who knows what that, now where there might have been one plant next door that died of that, right? Because plants have immune systems and there's natural stuff. It died, okay. Now the whole acreage, now all of those organisms are now floating and dropping on your plant. Now your plant's immune system can't overcome it. So now it becomes more and more difficult to grow anything. And so th that leaves you open now to in infestations of white fly, aphids, every kind of other disease. So we're, we're at a disadvantage, it's called externality. So every time a guy sprays glyphosate, that goes up into the air. We have inversions over here. A guy spraying glyphosate two miles away, we're breathing it here. They won't let us have a fire because of it. But, but they can spray toxic chemicals. Well, I mean, I gotta wear a mask in the grocery store, but there's no rules right. regulating my yeah. neighbor's spraying. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or, or a and guy down blocks. No, yeah. no. Yeah. You know it's what I mean? Like if it's, 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 about, it's, it's, it's about public. Yeah, and, and then there's, there's just you know. weird inconsistencies. And so, 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 so glyphosate is well known that it does all this. It doesn't just kill. It actually kills by creating disease. The disease reservoir is now increased. Well, what is it doing to the human biome if that's what it's, it does? Well, th that's the point of it is, is, is they said it doesn't affect humans, but it affects our guts. Oh, because yes. of the shigamatic pathway, yeah, pathway right. it kills our gut bacteria. Right, it, wow. right, right. Not that okay. you right. mammal. Right. Exactly. But that, but since all, so now, what do we have? We have what happened with the introduction of glyphosate. Now we have the ADHD. We right. have the, all the all right. the depression. We have yeah. all these all these problems that are because people don't have What's are losing their gut bacteria. Disease. Celiac. Well, that that actually right. goes to another thing. The, when they genetically modified corn, and it, uh, they, oh, they, yeah, they added a bacteria, they've added a bacteria to it that created was called thuricide. It's called uh, uh, whatever. It, we use it organically. It was basically you had a, a bat oh, third genus, BT. BT, BT corn. Yeah, BT corn. Yeah, third genus. Um, and so what, what it is, 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 okay, I want to kill that worm, that this butterfly is eating my thing, so I'll spray that, right? I'm not spraying the third genus poison, the BT. I'm just spraying a bacteria. That is, there's no poison on the plant. It's just a, a little bit of bacteria. No big deal. When the worm eats it, that bacteria goes into the worm, okay, creates a toxin that attacks the gut lining of that worm and kills the worm, the worm falls off, and it's done. There's no more toxin. When they, when they create BT corn, they insert, and I'll get into this, now we're into genetically modified, okay, so, which I re really like to talk about. Now they, they've inserted, and I'll get into the more specifics of this. Now they've, now they've introduced a packet of genes into, into this corn, and they, put it, they made it so that that toxin is now being produced in every cell of the corn, which means when the corn tassels and a bee eats that corn pollen, he's now getting killed by that. It's going into his gut. And then when you eat that corn, that gene that creates that toxin now can, it's called a horizontal gene transfer, has the potential of, of transferring into one of your gut bacteria. Now that gut bacteria is producing that third genus thing, which attacks our gut lining because our DNA and our gut lining is very similar to a worm. I hate to tell you that. Right. And so that's where the celiac wow, disease, the celiac. leaky guts, right. and all that stuff comes right. from. That's no big deal. So how do they create GMO, which is really 
which is where I get crazy, okay, which is the disingenuousness of the status quo. They would have you believe, oh, we inserted a gene and we made this incredible thing. And we go, wow, you guys are geniuses. Like, God, you guys are so great. Thank you. Oh, man, we're going to save the world. Why do they lie to us? Okay, you know what they do? You know how they create a GMO? How many people here really know how they create? I'm talking about the technology from about 40 years ago. And now they're doing, now they have, well, they have CRISPR and, and that kind of gene splice and a little more technology. That's CRISPR and this kind of thing. Okay. But most of the plants that are out there were created, they take um, a set of genes, okay? Genetic material from all different organisms, okay? One of them comes from a virus from a tobacco mosaic virus, or actually it's a cauliflower called mosaic virus. And that's a gene that actually turns on, because most of our genetic material, they don't understand how genetic, most, like three quarters of it doesn't even, isn't even on. It's called epigenetics. You guys can look up epigenetics. Only discovered in the last five or 10 years. But when they were doing this, they didn't understand epigenetics. They didn't understand that genes could be turned on. They knew that they could be turned on and off, but they didn't really know what the implications were. So they were trying to make insulin, okay? So this is how they made insulin, okay? And this has ended up being what they did in plants. I ta I've talked to the scientists many years ago. I talked to the scientists who developed these techniques and they looked at me and they said, I never thought it would get out of the laboratory. This never should have gotten out of the laboratory. Because what they did is they took a packet. Let's say we're making insulin. This is the same process of making BT corn. So you've got the gene they want to make insulin, okay? Or the gene they want to make the BT or the gene they want to make uh, uh, the uh, resistance to glyphosate. That's an interesting story. Because for years they said, oh, glyphosate doesn't affect soil organisms. It doesn't affect anything. It only just kills the plant. It's really specific, right? They spent 10 years in, in these glyphosate plants looking for a, something that was alive. For like 10 years. And they finally found a bacteria that was still alive. And then they found the gene in that bacteria that basically turned glyphosate into something they called NAD. And that, 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 all this information has been wiped. This was 10 years ago I saw this. And most of it's been wiped. It called, turned it into something called NAD. And uh, so they got that gene and, and they inserted that. That's what made Roundup ready. But it took them years to find anything that was still alive. Because glyphosate so, just so ended up killing everything. Throughout all that dead... Yeah. Material they search for any they kind search. of life because if they could find it, they could find a gene the, in there that would be resistant yeah. to the Roundup. Right. And then they could make Roundup ready. Ready crops, corn, right, Roundup ready this. Gene from yeah. that microorganism. Okay. In but they don't tell us this. So so now you've got you've got the gene, the expression gene. Okay, basically we'll call it right. Now. The expression gene needs a gene next to it to turn it on. So that's the on-off switch. I think they use the cauliflower mosaic virus or something gene for that. It's a virus. Then they found, then they went, okay, in the laboratory, we're going to insert this. But how do we know that we actually inserted it? Because the way they did it is they took all these genes, and I'll get to all the genes, and they put it on a microscopic little piece of silver or gold, like a bullet. And they created a gene gun. And they took cells, and, and they literally just Pow, 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 all over all these cells with a gene gun in the hopes that some of these little packets would make their way into the nucleus of the plant and, and bind somehow. They didn't have any conception of, of, of specific slicing of the gene and inserting it. They didn't do anything like that. So they said, well, how do we know if it even got in there? So they added another gene to it, and it was called the beta-glucuronidase gene. Beta-glucuronic acid is a substance we produce in our body. It's a scavenger in our body for cancer cells. It's one of our first things that kill cancer in our body. It's called glucuronic acid, okay? So they, but it turns out that when you break down glucuronic acid with beta-glucuronidase, which is the enzyme that breaks down glucuronic acid, it turns, I think, bright blue, okay? So they went, oh, this is great. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna shoot that in there and we're gonna drop a little bit of glucuronic acid on top of these cells. No, actually, I, I'm going ahead of myself. Wait a second. So, so, so ha the first thing they did is they, is they had to say which cells are growing, okay? To do that, they actually inserted five genes for, with antibiotic resistance, yeah. okay? So there was like all the major antibiotics, tetracycline, penicillin, da da da, da all the ones that, that we have bacteria that are resistant to now, they, they put a packet in there, and that way if they had the Petri dish, they could wash the Petri dish in antibiotics, and the cells that lived 
we knew were now expressing the gene correctly. So then they took all of those cells and they grew them out into a plant and then they said how do we prove that the plant is actually doing it and that's where they used the beta-glucuronidase. Then they would take a little piece of the plant, a little papaya seed, drop some glucuronic acid and express blue, they went, okay, this plant has definitely been genetically modified. Then they grow that out and then that's, that's where they make the plants that we now have, okay? So all of these things had to be done in a laboratory. Back then it was for insulin. So if they were making insulin, they would spread, do it with the antibiotics, they would take those cells, grow them out, then those cells would grow into a culture, then they would hit it with the beta-glucuronidase, the glucuronic acid, they turned blue, they went, okay, we, we did it. Then they would grow that out, then they would extract the insulin, then they would take everything that was left and incinerate it. They would never leave, it would be in a biohazard laboratory, and they would incinerate it. And then they would have pure insulin that they could give to people, okay? Reasonable. I mean, that's sort of reasonable, I guess, okay, even though we can solve insulin deficient problems with a lot of other things, but, but in insulin, you know, reasonable. So now, one day they went, oh, we can do this to plants. So now we have, we're eating genetically modified papayas. Now, you're, now that those uh, antibiotic resistant genes can horizontally transfer into your gut. Okay, now in the sewage system, there's this, you're pooping it out. Now it's ending up, that's why the ocean, that's why we, there's so much MERS now, antibiotic, resi you know, methicillin, MRS, whatever, methicillin resistant, staphylococcal, MRSA, mm, yeah. is, on the, is, is down by the ocean. It's where all the sewage ends up, right? So all this stuff is there, all caused by genetically modified foods wow. that get in people's guts that create all these problems. They won't, ever, you know, well, they won't admit it or anything. It's just like, oh man, nature, what a, what a problem. But when you eat a papaya, there's a real chance because it's not been cooked or anything that some of these genes can get into you. And that's one of the real hazards. I was, since 95, I've been fighting against genetically modified papayas and I watched them it actually release more virulent viruses that they had already genetically modified. And it was just, it was horrendous what, how they pulled that one off. It was just unbelievable. So what, now what are we going to go talk about? Wait, uh, wait, glyphosate, wait. what? Okay, okay, tell me. You know, you get no problem. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go, 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 please. Papayas. Yeah. Viruses. Right. What are you talking about? Okay, there's I, mean, I know about a, GMO on our... Okay, well, well, well what, what happens? What happens in, in agriculture? My, my theory on, 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 on agriculture, okay, is we're seeing it now with the COVID. You pack a lot of people into a city, feed them really crappy food, force them to inhale and breathe in all their toxins, people are going to get sick. A monoculture crop is like that. Mm. Papayas, I looked at papayas back in the 90s, especially more back in the 80s, when I saw how it was being grown in Kona. Every farmer here could have had, and I did it, I did it, had 200 papaya trees. There's such a desire for, you, we could a supplement we, for, at a dollar a pound, we could all be making an extra two, three hundred dollars a Wait, week. Did you export them at that time? No, no, just, just consuming locally here. Oh, really? Just consuming locally. People wanted to eat papayas, dry them, and you could export them. But if it was just a little backyard gardens, and this is how it's done in Thailand, Lots of them. We also, papaya, green papaya is a great food. We, we could actually develop an industry with green papaya. But the point of it is, when papayas are very fragile, their roots are very fragile, it grows really fast, it really is susceptible to a lot of different diseases. Especially right now with the rains and all the GMO and all the craziness, there's a lot of things, the, uh, the, uh, the, the powdery mildew is really horrible on it, which can be cured with something called Cali Green, right? Potassium, which is potassium bicarbonate. Carbon, yeah. It's really, really easy to fix that. Most of the, most of the fungal diseases can be cured with, with copper, um, copper uh, hydroxide or what they call it. It's just a, it's, it's, it's a soluble, co micronized copper, they call it. Uh, once in a while, you can spray that. You don't want to spray that too much. And there's sulfur that you can spray. They can basically get, get almost anything under control really super easily if you really wanted to do that. But papayas, if it was in everyone's backyard, we could all, every farmer could be making an extra couple hundred dollars. But instead, they went, fuck that, you know. So they just went into Pune and went into the low-level rainforest. Virgin, ohia, shrub, rainforest. No respect. They just brought the bulldozers in and scraped the, the top six inches off. 
I worked in the industry. I did soil tests back then as the problem started happening. So I was trying to create fertilizer solutions and, 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 and management solutions for different growers. But they would literally go in and scrape off the top six inches and create berms. They would literally just take the rainforest into 20 acre sections and, and with piles higher than this of all the ohia and rocks and stuff like that and then they put their papayas in with the minimum amount of soluble fertilizers, no calcium. And, I, and, they, and they said, mm, what do you think it is? I said, well, I, well it's obviously papayas have a root problem, roots equal calcium, it's probably a calcium problem, uptake problem. I said, well, do soil tests on all our fields. And so I did soil tests on all their fields. And literally, I, I could predict which ones were the worst viruses, okay? by the amount of calcium in the soil. It started out at about 150, 200 pounds of calcium per acre. There's about a million pounds of soil in, in an acre. 10,000 pounds of organic matter is 1% of the soil, okay? So you have, and when it got, finally got to virus time, it was less than 10 pounds per acre. Mm -hmm. But they didn't want to put the calcium out because that was going to eat into their thing. So then they would just abandon the fields. And the, fee the trees were totally covered in disease. And then they go plant somewhere else. And eventually they checkerboarded all the Puna like that. So the ring spot virus was just kept going. The virus that occurred to purge out this environment. Right. And then, and then even that one wasn't that bad because they, 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 we could take care of it. Then they brought in the more virulent one from someplace so, else. So, kind of finish your question is like yeah. through that disease that was caused by the poor farming practices. Yeah. They, the, the smart guys or the dumb guys created a GMO papaya to solve the problem they created to begin with, you know? Gotcha. And, but, but the interesting part is there's a lot of restrictions because we were fighting it and fighting it and fighting it. And so what they did is they, they were allowed to do experimental fields. Now, in a normal papaya field, we have three kinds of papaya trees, okay? There's the female papaya, which is a makes a kind of a big round cannonball whenever you see the big round cannonball fruits. Those are female papayas and it has a, a fairly large flower, okay, and it doesn't have anything red inside. It has no pollen. All it has is this kind of little green uh, place where the seeds are created, where the fruit is created. Then you have the male papaya, which is basically just a floret and, it, and it's a really pretty flower. Every, every now and then it makes a fruit, but and it has, a, has like a red kind of dark pollen inside it. And then you have the hermaphrodite. The hermaphrodite is self-pollinating and it actually looks just like a female flower, a little bit smaller, but it has the, uh, the pollen inside it. And that's the one you want to grow commercially because it self-pollinates, it isn't sending pollen out all over the place. It actually grows fairly true to seed. When I got involved in the papaya industry, which we get back to, Everyone that grew papayas shared their new varieties. And we, and we used to get, I'd go up to a field and say, you've got to try row 12. It's unbelievable. And I'd go, oh, here's some seeds from row 12 because they would be harvesting and they'd go, wow, this tree is producing so much better than any other trees. It's more delicious. And they became the varieties that we call today, the, sun, the strawberry or the this or the Gaboho Logro or whatever. They all started out with names called row 12 or Field six or something like that's that. That's just natural genetic variation. That's just natural genetic variation. So, no so when, environmental variation. so when when they brought in, I was fighting this back in the early '90s, and I would go, I would go, how come we're not walking through these virus fields looking for the trees that survive, right. Right. and and growing those out? Instead, they were just abandoning the fields and letting the virus just spread. The industry itself destroyed the industry. Then they brought in their experimental fields. And in, and, and in a normal papaya field, you'd kill the females because you didn't want cross-pollination. And you would kill the males because you didn't want pollen going everywhere. You just wanted, no. In the experimental fields, they basically encouraged males. Males. They left off because they wanted to pollinate all they of Hawaii. They, they wanted to cross-pollinate every tree in Puna so that they would be then be allowed to grow it. They would say, oh, it's already contaminated oh, all of Puna. Yeah. Oh, like so they just yeah. sending out right. GMO pollen. So, so on the one hand, they made sure they abandoned all the fields that had virus instead of cutting the trees down and getting rid of them so the virus wouldn't spread, which is just normal practice. 
abandoned fields everywhere, papaya virus everywhere. They, but, but I would have been all about that if they would have gone down row 12 and found that papaya oh, tree that was still living, you know, and then did a little cross pollinating. And back then I was also scientist, and it's called uh, marker assisted breeding. See, because they're so smart back then, we could go into that tree on row 12 that was growing. They could open it up, look at it, and go, whoa, that's the difference. There now we're going to breed that, and we're going to see if that, it's called marker assisted breeding. So using all of their knowledge, all of their laboratories, right. all of the, they could have done fairly conventional breeding to develop resistant strains. So as opposed not a lot of profit, oh, not a lot of profit, not a lot of control. Right, right, right. So that's papaya, that's the, and that's the papaya game. I don't know. You know. What did you say just to finish that? There was that? a second round of GMO papaya. Yeah, yeah, and then it's so just they weren't able to. They, they, they weren't the one that was infecting Kona and here and there. They weren't able to make a tree for that. So what they did is they brought in a way more virulent virus that they basically infected all of Puna with, made it almost impossible to grow papaya. So is it not true or true that if you see ring spot virus on your papaya tree in your yard that you don't have a GMO strain, or is it mm, true or not true that... First of, first of all, I actually went to... T I, I did a lot of advocacy against it. You really have to know you have ring spot because a lot of people have anthracnose or some other disease that they call ring spot. They also made that. Every disease became ring spot. Just like it's the same model they're doing with COVID. Any way you die, it's COVID. So every papaya disease was ring spot. Ring spot is really obvious. You really see a certain modeling of the leaf. You see a certain spot in the middle of the leaf. That's where the ring is. There's a certain kind of, the ring looks slightly different than anthracnose or, or thing. You really have to identify it as ring spot. So is that and statement I made true or false? I would say, I would say you want to destroy that tree. Well, it's probably true that it's not genetically modified. Yeah, probably. But second or third generation, possibly it doesn't really matter because of those things, the gen how just. this statement I've heard on the yeah. too? Every papaya tree on the Big Island has genetic modification. No, well, that that can be proven by just getting some glucuronic acid and a little scalpel. We can prove that. We can prove that one way or the other. Because so anyone, probably not true. Probably not true because because you want first of all you want to grow a tree that you're pretty sure isn't genetically modified, and you want to make sure you're 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 not you're you're you know, isolated. So when I used to do, during that period, we would go out, if someone wanted to grow papayas, we would go around the neighbors and make sure we cut down every tree and said, oh, we'll bring you a better tree. Mm. We'll get rid of all the diseases and we'll do all that and we, we just clean it up. And, and nobody really minded because papayas are a year or two. I use papayas in a natural orchard session as, as a nurse crop. So let's say I'm planting a, a, a citrus field or even pineapples or something. You want to plant papayas in it for the first year or two because it grows fast, it'll help shade, it'll help protect. The way its roots are, it creates a lot of organic matter. And then when it's finished, you cut those down and now you have your orchard growing. Everything else is growing. You know, so the papayas are, are in a small scale farming are very valuable and they perverted it. Just like sugar cane, incredibly healthy, filled with minerals, the most, the best thing for your teeth to chew on sugar cane. The absolute, the kids that chew on sugar cane from when they're little have the best teeth in the world. Yep. But you take that sugar and you process it and you take out all the minerals and you turn it into white sugar, it becomes a horrible, horrible poison. So we, we can take any, we live in a dualistic world. We can take anything that's really good and turn it into really bad. We can have a really, you know, the road, you know, the road to uh, the, what, the road to perdition is filled with good intentions or whatever. Yeah, the road, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, um, that's how the game is played. But it, but but we really come back to working with nature, you know. So so we we look at what can grow, what has grown, what are our needs, what do we want to do, how do we want to monetize something, and then we have to understand that we live in a natural environment. How do we re so? Where I'm coming from, I think where Logan comes from, let's recreate the rainforest in a small way. Let's get the natural cycling of materials. Then we go back to the science of it. How do we cycle organic matter correctly? There's a certain balance that has to happen in the soil. It's called base saturation rate. You can actually, if you're doing a 100 acre farm, maybe we'll test you for best base saturation and we'll test you for cation exchange capacity. And we'll say, hey, we gotta get your magnesium, we gotta get your potassium, we gotta get the sodium level right, we gotta get all these different elements in proper balance and then what happens, the biology comes into play, the, the organic matter starts cycling correctly and now we don't need so much fertilizer because what happens when you use glyphosate and you kill things in this way, 
you're killing the beneficial organisms that are now turning that organic matter into stable organic matter. And this is where we get back to how disingenuous this world is. Stable organic matter is long chain carbon. Okay, that's what we call humus or humic acids that people call it fulvic acids, which are incredibly healing. <coughs> Fertility, it's stable carbon. Every 1% increase in organic matter is 10,000 pounds of organic matter. If we were going to go to the uh, carbon store and say, hey, I want some carbon credits for increasing my organic matter, they, are giving, they would give you $100 for, for, sta for keep, basically uh, sequestering, it's called, carbon, that amount of carbon. It's $100 worth of carbon dioxide you've now sequestered in your acre. So if they, were, they really wanted to solve climate change, if that was really real, you know, who knows, they would give every organic farmer that increased his soil by 1% $100. They'd have to. Because they're paying some multi-millionaire hundreds of dollars for the same amount of carbon to, 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 to freeze it and inject it into the, into, under the core of the earth or something. But they could be giving it to us. If we just increase the organic matter in the United States 1% in the soil, we would sequester all of the carbon dioxide used by all the fossil fuels in the United States. If we just spread five acres of rock dust, basalt rock dust, on every acre in the United States, we would basically almost all the carbon dioxide of the world. They've already, they came out with a study just like a week ago. How, how basalt rock, which we have over here, it's one of the business, one of the businesses I wanted to do many, many years ago, was the university had developed a, um, a termite barrier. I was doing a lot of consulting and a lot of people putting houses in and stuff like that. And back then, um, you ever heard of heptachlor, chlordane, those chemicals? Anyone heard of that? Oh, that's a rabbit hole we could go down. But let's, it's a very, very toxic insecticide. Very, very long lasting, very toxic insecticide. And it was utilized by, <clears throat> we can go, we'll, I'll, I'll get to it, but it was used in the pineapple industry uh, really heavily, okay? It was to get rid of ants. Like we have a real problem with ants and pineapples. Um, but what they did is they spiked it. You've heard of the guys coming over and spiking under new foundations for termites? Okay. That's yeah. the chemical that they put under the foundations, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, up to a half a mile, I was just talking to my brother over here about, it's a wetlands down there. They should not be using any toxic chemicals anywhere on the coastline. That's a wetlands. This is where all the fresh water comes down right. underneath this lava, lava uh, bench. The, the interplay of, of, of fresh and uh, creating all the life around the islands, all of the fish. It's the beginning of the food chain. Okay? There should be no development, no toxic chemicals at least. But what are they doing? They're building their rich, fancy houses and they're injecting a floor underneath these foundations. So golf many courses. golf courses. Yeah, I mean, I worked in the golf course industry too, trying to change. I actually made some real. I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, my proudest probably moment over here. I didn't make any money, but, but I, I'm very proud of it. But so um, during this period, the they, university developed what they call the basalt termite barrier, which is where they crushed basalt down into sand, as small, fine as they could do it. Then they washed all the dust out of this. They just had a pure sand. <coughs> then they found that if they... Uh, put like six inches, eight inches, 12 inches underneath the foundation, when the termites would come up, it would collapse. So the termites could never get, it's called basalt termite barrier, BTB. Turned out that if you made, a, 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 thank you, if you made a, a, you know, f tons of basalt termite barrier, you'd also have all this dust left over, it's called rock dust. Rock dust is ground finer than talcum powder, 200 microns, very, very fine. It can be consumed by soil bacteria immediately. 15% of all uh, our soil is minerals, right? The rest is organic matter, carbon, oxygen, organic things, right? And water. So it turns out that if you put a ton of rock dust down, the fine, fine, fine stuff, that'll be consumed by soil bacteria, turned into soil, and it'll actually literally create 10 tons of organic matter. One or two tons. Two tons of, of rock dust will create 10 tons of organic matter. From the microbes. Just from the microbes eating the, the rock dust. 
that'll also fix all that nitri all that carbon dioxide now because the microbes are taking carbon dioxide and water and making their bodies up. Mm. But they just actually admitted it about a week ago. One of the scientists admitted that if we spread rock dust on all our farmlands, the carbon dioxide would disappear up from the planet. Actually, I knew this 30 years, 40 years ago. I was a proponent for rock dust back in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> I actually went all over the country taking rock dust to people and demonstrating the whole concept. I was bringing rock dust over here, selling it to people for years. I put all my farms in with rock dust and stuff. But, um, and so that stuff you can get from the West Hawaii concrete, which is which, which is sort of powder. It's not quite powdered it's right, right now. Where you want it. Not quite where you want it. It's about 30 percent. It's about 30 percent dust. 20, 30 percent dust. But it's also pretty good for over here because we don't have soil, so it, it kind of gives you a little bit of extra structure. And also the finer powder particles, the bacteria, if they don't consume it, they can live on it and eventually consume them. So I like it. What we used to do was, was I had a container with a hole chopped out of it, and we would send it over, we would send it filled with cinders from here to Oahu, sell the cinders over there, then we'd drop it off and we would get this BTB bus, but I needed somebody over there because they would always want to put the crap stuff in, and someone had to be there to make sure they got the stuff that was what were correct. You it with? What? What would you refill it with? we fill it with the, dust. The, the, the dust that was the byproduct of the BTB. Okay. The, the, and I'd bring that over to here, and I sold it for like $90 a ton or something. I mean, I was making $5, $10 a ton when it was all done after I paid everybody. And eventually the container broke apart and I, and I had a family and I, and I stopped doing that. But um, that's when I went to the other, the, uh, like the very, very fine, the mortar sand, they call it over there from West Hawaii Concrete. But I was going around the legislature saying, we don't need to spray any chemicals underneath houses anymore. Let's just mandate BTB then all that other rock dust, we could just give it away to people. It would take care of climate change, it would increase fertility, it would reduce the need for any pesticides, and they looked at me and said, oh no, we can't compete with the industries. And that was when Brewer, actually I was bringing over a byproduct of the magnesium mines, it was called dicalcium silicate, and I was changing how everybody was doing things, because right now we use calcium carbonate, right? Magnesium carbonate, dolomite, coral sand. What's, what happens when you put coral sand on, uh, it, it, it helps alkalize the soil, right? But what's the, the chemical thing that happens? The calcium goes in, right? Pushes off the hydrogen molecule, right? Which is the acidic part. That, that combines with the, C, with the carbonate, per, uh, with the CO2, which is calcium, you know, CaCO2, right? Which is calcium carbonate, right? Then it becomes a uh, hydro, you know, carbonic acid, which is very unstable, and it breaks into water and carbon dioxide. So every time you put out car calcium, you're releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So I said, why don't we use the dicalcium silicate? And what happens there What's the is, from? that came from magnesium mining or iron mining and stuff like that. And, but what happened there was the calcium would push the hydrogen off, right? And then you'd, you'd end up with silicic acid, right, which would then push off the phosphate off, <laughs> off the aluminum molecule and it would create aluminum uh, silicate, which is clay. So you'd actually go into a field that was virgin Hawaiian soil, right, and you wanted to up, you'd end up with extra clay, no calcium, no carbon dioxide, the pH was way less to change the pH. It was just an amazing product. And so what happened was I was starting to develop a business over here doing that. C. Brewer found a way worse quality product. At that time, they changed their name from uh, Brewer Chemical. They changed their name to Brewer Environmental. And they went af literally went after me. They started bringing over calcium silicate from Australia below the price of shipping. They sold it for less than it would cost to ship it for a year and a half until they drove me out of business. Wow. It's like a Walmart move. And it was over. And then they stopped bringing that over because it was crap and it didn't work and everyone went, oh, this stuff doesn't work, but it wasn't. I had it ground fine. I had it just right. They brought over this chunky, weird crap. So, John, we're getting kind so, of close. I don't know what to say. Okay, what else? I don't know. Let me recap and then kind of direct the, the, the wrap up here.
Right, is everybody pretty, like, uh, there's a few things I really wanted John to drive home. First okay. of all, I wanted to, him to motivate you guys to be organic farmers. Oh, oh yeah, well, the one thing I want to say is that if you do want to change your pH and it's raining really hard, you can use seawater. Right, which is a K and F. Input. Oh, oh, it is. Okay. So, so, so seawater is amazing, and there's a good book on it, Fertility from the Deep, Sea Energy, Agriculture, Made in Murray. That's a good one to just to think about. That. I wanted and to just I throw that one I also wanted him to drive home what, what glyphosate really is, and I think he touched on that pretty well. It's yeah. become pretty clear on the, the Roundup thing. Yeah. The other one I wanted him to drive home was what GMO is, and that it's not just a cartoon of a thing yeah. splicing and inserting and splicing. But yeah, we have a potential for, for, for antibiotic resistance. We have potential to create uh, beta glucuronidase in our bodies that takes away our first cancer, ca uh, first one of the first lines of defense against cancer. Yeah. The, 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 you, know, so you can look up glucuronidase. People actually take it as a supplement now. So. GMO, are you guys pretty cool? I mean, he touched on the gold packet full of uh, of the D of the DNA of different whatever they're trying to shoot into the petri dish. They also put it in viruses and then infect something with the virus. They use, also use viruses different to do it. There's to different the ways DNA to do it. That melt together, but it's not. You, the scientist isn't going to no. oh, insert no. and sew back together. <laughs> you know, so it's a really Frankenstein situation. And and now we know epigenetics, and we know that by changing where a gene is. It, uh, things can be turned on and turned off, right? Which is the scary part of the genetic testing they're doing with humans. Because a case in point would be, okay, genetics, which is, which I'm really afraid of with the, all this genetic stuff. We, you know, they, they say they found the gene for violence, right? I'm sure you heard that. And, we're, and when, when we find that gene in a five-year-old, we're gonna make sure that kid doesn't go to school or maybe even put him in jail right away. But it turns out that that gene in for violence is an epigenetic gene. It only is turned on if the kid is sexually abused when he's a year or two old or know, beaten, right? okay? So actually, it, 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 it's a response for survival. Okay, so 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 you go in and get tested. Oh, you're a violent person, but you, mm -hmm. but actually it's a gene for intelligence. It's the gene that makes you intelligent. It's the gene that does all these other things. So when we start talking about changing the genetics of things, the implications are way beyond any way they, like you, uh, the phrase the cartoon simplicity that they're trying to say. These, and, and what I want to drive home is we're all scientists. They're really coming out with the scientists know and the scientists mean double blind right. studies and right. stuff. We are scientists. Yeah. You add something and it grows. You go, hmm, that's interesting. Have my friend try it. Oh, it worked. We're on to something. We are the scientists. We have, to, we have to own that. We have to own that. You've heard that eugenics got rebranded as genetics? Hmm. Because the Nazis give us... Well, yeah, yeah, but it, 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 I think it, it, if you look at it, it's part of, they're part of different things. Yeah. Eugenics is uh, a real perversion. And, and you, actually, eugenics has been uh, taken over by Planned Parenthood, I think. That's, that's, that's what Planned Parenthood is, the evol evolution of eugenics. The same people that did eugenics created Planned Parenthood. Right. But oh. having the vaccine food yeah. as the weapon... Food as a weapon, it's been used as a weapon forever. Carthage must be destroyed. They salt it over all their fields. Uh, yeah. Kill all the buffalo. Cut down all the, all the breadfruit. Right. Uh, send GMO around the world. Let's, let's in, uh, infect Mexico with all their corn. Uh, food as a weapon. Cheap food from the United States. How we destabilize the world. How do we destabilize the world? All the, the, we went in, killed off all the Indians, killed off all the buffalo, then we grew cheap grain in the middle of America, sent it down the Mississippi River, it's about 1850, sent it over to Eastern Europe, so cheap that we put everybody out of business over there, created all of the apocalypse that happened in Eastern Europe, when we're talking about the rise of, of totalitarianism, uh, the, all of the horrible things that happened in Russia, and all of that, the great uh, fleeing of Ukraine, and that whole area, that whole bread bag, we destroyed all of that with our cheap food. So cheap food is a weapon, expensive food is a weapon, cutting food off is a weapon, on every level food is a weapon. We need air, and we need water, and we need food. The fact that they have, they have taken food at, that into the supermarkets, Bill of Rights, free speech, I think I believe in that, free religion. The Bill of Rights should be everybody has a right to breathe clean air. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a right, God-given right, to, to drink clean water. And everybody has a God-given right to eat clean food. <coughs> Until we get that mindset going, we're all in a lot of trouble. 
at this point. Well, obviously. I, I mean, it's all a weapon. They, they can weaponize anything that we need. And right now, what we really need is we need this. We need community. We need yeah. people coming together. And now they weaponize that. They weaponize that. That's like the last one. Thing, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. The human connection thing. Yeah. Uh, ten or more in a room. Right. No music. Yeah. Right. I'm, yeah. Watch, I'm watching this TV show, and it's and it's about the American Revolution. And granted, it's a TV show, but the guy goes, the governor, the, the governor of Britain is in America trying to control everyone, and he goes, oh, I just imposed a a, a non ten or more to gather, and the guy laughs and he goes, he goes, oh, that's that's so you can uh, so they can't conspire against you, right? And he laughs and he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he told them this whole other reason why they can't gather in 10 or more. You know, like, just like uh -huh. we, we, you know, this is a TV show. They just aired it while this was going. Oh. And they're, t and they're telling you 10 or more can't gather. And that's like what they're telling you on the news. And it's on this TV show. I'm just going, man, this is yeah, too much, yeah, yeah. you know? Well, that's, that's part of it. They just, they just, they've dumbed every, dumb, everyone down so much. No one's like able to make connections. Like all this stupid stuff <coughs> they're doing yeah. Well, just just even finding out, even today, I was you know I come here to really learn. I really do. I'm not here to 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 to, to show you how whatever I am. You know, I'm really here to learn. I'm really a really, and I actually learned something that they've been putting human stuff in our food forever with that hair. They turned us all into cannibals. We, <laughs> We're all cannibals. <laughs> it's unbelievable. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, you know, it's like bizarre. What? What? Three and four on the soil. Excuse me. What's that? Characteristics of soil. So characteristics. So so we have so we have physicality of the soil, place, structure, stuff like that. We have the chemicals of the soil, pH mineral content, uh, relative uh, balancing of the soil, different minerals, so you can cycle your organic matter. Then you have the biology of the soil, which is the organics. Uh, and again, again, when we're talking about good and bad microbes, um, when EM technologies first came out, when, which eventually evolved into KNF, it was looked at as a probiotic, very, very similar to our gut. So the EM technologies are really probiotic. So a lot of these things that people will go, oh my God, you're putting, you're putting fermented stuff. You know that anaerobic, anaerobic bacteria are horrible for the soil. But it turns out that the anaerobic bacteria that KNF does are actually food, are actually probiotics for the good bacteria. So what, in a normal situation where you don't have any good bacteria and it's all crap, you throw anaerobics out, yeah, it's going to kill a plant, it's going to screw things up. So there aren't anything, nothing's good or bad at this point, okay? So, so, so the proper anaerobics actually are good because they actually feed, they're like acidophilus. They're like acidophilus feeds the bifidus, right? The bifidus is all the good bacteria, right, in our gut. So we eat probiotics bifidus and all that to encourage the good ones, right? And so that's what KNF does, that's what the uh, biodynamics talks about. And then uh, the spiritual aspect of the soil, where we're actually connecting to the Divine Mother, we're getting the spiritual downloads, we're getting the, the balance in our life that we're here for. We've evolved on this planet, whether you look at microevolution or macroevolution, whether you think we we're just put here like this. We, over, there's been microevolutions going on for millions of years with humans. And we all grew up together. We grew up eating these plants. We grew up cultivating these plants for our medicines, the colors and the flavors and stuff like that. And so the spiritual aspect to me is the most important aspect now in my life. This is where I connect with the divine. There's a lot of philosophers that have said you connect with the divine when you grow something and eat it. And everybody here, I'm sure, has had that experience of growing something and eating it and going, God, this is the best lettuce I have ever taken, the best pineapple, anyone, the best coffee I've ever had, the best pumpkin I've ever had. Everybody, every, like right now, my big thing is mac nut and cacao. I make that in the morning for myself. Oh, so you're telling me your uh, special drink you make that frappuccino or the Oh, the macchino. Yeah, I'll just I'll just take mac nuts and honey and whiz them into a paste. I'll pour my coffee in and whiz it up, and boom, I have a macchino. Very good. It's like what all the girls are doing now with that little freaking. A little, like, stupid. Like frother? Yeah, the frother thing. Yeah, yeah, it, make, it comes out frothy. Actually, the mac nuts come out frothy. It comes out super frothy. Yeah, like, in the blender, it froths right up. 
Jobs been doing it for 30 years. Oh, exactly. Yeah, Macachinos, yeah. It's like... Uh, was number three. It's spiritual. Spiritual. Which is why I, ha I have a web page we're developing and, uh, and, and my Instagram is Supernatural, ag Matt, Supernatural Agriculture. Question in the back, John. Yeah. yeah. Um, how come we overlook the consumption of insects so much? And is there anybody in Hawaii who's consuming insects or looking to do something? You know, I, I used to call cockroaches land lobsters. You know, and, and, and talking human consumption. Yeah. yeah, and and I I think it's been demonized again. Anything that's going to take people away from becoming self-sufficient and not dependent out there, we demonize it. And so we we meet cockroaches are disgusting, but cockroaches and lobsters are almost exactly the same thing. But lobsters are great, right? And actually, it turns out if you can look and look and look it up. There's actually people, the Hawaiian cockroach is actually now milk for superfood. The milk <laughs> from Hawaiian cockroaches is the most expensive superfood on the planet right now. The milk from the Hawaiian cockroach. Okay. Yeah, but, but I mean, we actually around the world, you know, mealy grubs, grubs, a lot of our compost, sometimes I'll look at it. If I was really hungry, there's some really... The, great, great. Yeah, those, those, those larvae are amazing. Yeah. So again, that comes out to survival foods. Like I have a lot of things growing on my farm that I'm not eating every day. Could be leaves of the soursops tree. It could be hono hono grass, stuff like that. So there's a lot we don't eat. But, but I know I can eat, which actually helps me spiritually because I know I'm never going to starve. And, it, and I know 20 people could come up on my farm and we could survive. Yeah, what's that? Now that you're bringing this up, yeah. a lot of people are saying that okay. over the next year there's going to be fast food shortages. Definitely. It's not a, really yeah. to rough times. Yeah. Can you just speak a little bit to what a like, really practical, what people should grow, what people should eat, what food shortages you see? Happening, on okay. Okay. You know, survival. It was well, survival food. I would say. I would say one next, of the main. Next week's class is going to be all about that. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, there's fast growing root crops: tapioca, makashira, sweet potatoes, taro. Things that can grow in a few months. We got to get those things in the ground. Okay. If you're a little more sophisticated, you can take white potatoes, sprout them, and, and get them out there. If you can, you know, control the fungus, you can usually get really good small potatoes and stuff. Those Are things will grow. So all those things can be processed and dried. Makashira can be turned into a flower. Breadfruit, if you've got two, two years, three years, you can get a breadfruit tree up. I would say plant some breadfruits right away. Flower. Right away. Breadfruit is amazing. Any ripeness, all the way to, like I used to make up when I had my bit, one of my businesses going, I would take breadfruit, really ripe breadfruit, mix it with papaya, and I would make an incredible bready uh, kind of uh, fruit leather. It was amazingly sustainable. Is it from seed? Uh, you have to do them from cuttings. Usually they're, yeah, they're done yeah. root cuttings. Root cuttings, yeah. Yeah, and then there, there's a, there, is, there is a breadfruit called a bread nut that you can make a seed and the bread nut is actually tastes just like a peanut and you, you harvest it when it falls. It kind of is rotten and then you collect all the nuts and boil them and it's just like peanuts and they're amazing. And you, can and you can plant that and you plant that and that makes the rootstock that you then you can graft your, 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 your breadfruit too. Yeah, and then um, then microgreens. I'm looking at um, I'm looking at things like broccoli, different things like that that you can plant uh, sunflowers, uh, which you can plant a tray in and get greens immediately and let a few grow out, and then you have a bunch of sunflower seeds that you can dry and then regrow as a microgreen. Amaranth. I think microgreens are very very important. Kalalu amaranth is a big one. I was just talking to, to, to guys about that. There's a red amaranth and there's a green kaalu that are uh, probably my favorite greens in the world. That's super easy, easy to grow. Papayas, I think, are super important. Grows within a year or two. The green papaya is a vegetable. It's also high in enzymes, incredible for digestion. What's that? Chayote. There's, there's a white and a green chayote that grows really fast. You can eat the tips of it. You, you use uh, natural trees as trellises. What I like to do is a lot, a lot of people go, oh, we got to build trellises. No, there's, 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 there's levels. You can grow a chayote on an avocado tree or something like that. So we can, we can look at our, our plantings as, hey, I'm going to use this as my uh, ground cover 
Now, this is going to grow up a tree and make more things. I mean, um, even things like eggplant. You know, a lot of people put that in the garden. I, I've had really good results just putting an eggplant out in the orchard because it grows into a really nice bush. It really actually has to be by itself. So there's a lot of vegetables that you think have to be in a garden, but you can actually grow them as bushes and stuff like that. I think mac nuts are incredible. Mac nuts are 70. I, I used to hear it was 70, and now I'm hearing 75, 80% oil, high in polymolytic acid, which is a really important health oil. It takes, the, uh, it takes the fatty liver, it cures fatty liver disease, it takes the fat off your heart. Um, <clears throat> it's high, the, the protein is highly, highly digestible. I think there's also algaes, diatoms, stuff like that, uh, cl cl chloretta. No, you can grow them. What's that? You didn't well, I'm getting there. I'm going there. <laughs> there's, sugar, there's sugar cane, bananas, obviously. Coconuts are, you know, fairly site specific. Uh, above a thousand feet, you're going to have. It's going to take a long time to make a coconut. So, so I, yeah, I, I honestly believe maybe 20, 30 years ago, we were advocating the let's get let's get this coastline planted in coconuts. But it was like, oh my God, no property rights and all this other stuff. You know, not cool. But um, Coconuts are incredible, obviously. Uh, but macadamia nuts, I'm really high on macadamia nuts. I think it's an amazing Obviously, food. Yeah, day. yeah. But it's, it's, it's an incredible, incredible food. You and don't need an orchard. You don't need an orchard, no, no. Avocado is, is um, if you, uh, what I'm finding is most of my seedlings, and we get back to a term called morphic resonance, right? Our energetic, the spirituality of us helps the genetics also. So when I first got here, there's a lot of really weird seedlings. Now it seems like every seedling that comes up on my land is a variety, is an amazing variety. So I'm starting to, I have like dozens of incredible uh, just seedling avocados that I want to graft to other avocados and make my own varieties. But there's a really a lot of great avocados. You can grow them, grow it up to about this tall in a year or two. It might take 11 to 12 years, 15 years for an avocado to make fruit. But if you graft it, it only takes five or six years. So or yeah, less. yeah, or less. Okay. So 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 avocados are very important. Anything uh, protein and oils. We're looking at protein and oils for survival. And then the, then there's just the weeds that grow around here. There's so many uh, nutritious weeds. There's go to cola. There's different things from the uh, from uh, different places in the world, like uh, ashwagandha, things like that are super important. Uh, tomatoes, small cherry tomatoes can go wild. There are people that have problems with that, with arthritis and stuff. So you got to look at yourself and your health and how you deal with nightshades and stuff like that when you talk about tomatoes and stuff. Beans, there's uh, perennial beans. There's a perennial lima bean that really grows really well. But all beans, I think, are really good. Um, <clears throat> corn, I've had some really great successes with some of the Hawaiian corns. You know, if you can get it into the right environment and the right spot, out of the wind, no pigs and Master dogs. Corn. Man, I love corn. The corn is amazing. And remember, grasses are really amazing too. As uh, I'm sure Master Cho talks about it, grasses are really high in sugars and stuff like that, which really help the fungal breakdowns. Remember, the Korean natural farming is really an outgrowth of, of, of many different currents of stuff. And, and back when I was first getting into farming, one of the big types of farming was leaf mold farming. where we And leaf mold is the, that white bacteria, the white, the white fungus, the mycelium. So, so <clears throat> Anything that produces a lot of leaves, kukui nuts. I think kukui nuts are great because that can be coppice. That's a great fertilizer tree. Kukui nuts were used by the Hawaiians was one of their major composting trees because you can cut it and it grows back really fast. You can roast the seeds and, and it's very edible. But isn't that the one that, it, one of the ones like um, where nothing will grow underneath? It's a no, that's a eucalyptus. That's a eucalyptus. No, nah, I mean, kukui nuts, everything grows There's in the eucalyptus. There's that up there. What's that? Uh, guava. Strawberry guava is fantastic. I love strawberry guava. I love guavas. Guavas are great. Borders, so yeah, podocarpus, podocarpus. Podocarpus. That thing will yeah, kill yeah, that's yeah, but kukui nut, no, kukui nut creates fertility amazing. Yeah. Just at, you break that, uh, avocados also are great yeah. uh, for drop chopping yeah. and dropping. The, 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 it turns into dome. You can take an avocado thing in two years, open it up, and you have potting soil literally yeah. in the thing. You can pick, pick up the log and carefully bring it over, and it's pure potting soil. But again, <laughs> We go back to Korean natural farming. A lot of these things are, are enhanced by, <clears throat> by enhancing the proper bacteria and funguses and so molasses. That's why I was always advocating for a good organic sugar industry over here because I love getting commercial molasses, I'll tell you. Molasses is amazing for breaking stuff down. Just, it's just 
And it's August, just we're going to have another KNF course. So anyone that hasn't taken the KNF course will be offering a, a two weekend KNF course in August again. So we used to get we used to get uh, molasses from Maui when they were doing sugar over there and fifty five gallon drums and well, stuff. Yeah. It was really nice. It made farming really super easy. It was one of my go-to profilers back then, back in the day. Because it's high in iron, it's high in uh, lots of minerals, it was near mineralization. Well, you got to grow a sugar cane. You can grow sugar cane. But, but, but you pretty site specific, pretty site specific and you really got to be, you got to get it right. And, and it's really nice. You get a little sugar cane press, you can get the sugar out of it, and you have all this big gas. That really breaks down super quick. So, so sugar cane is a really, really good crop, fairly fast growing. But you really want it flat, you really want it su sunny, you really want to manage it also. You've got to manage your sugar cane well, a little bit more. There's some guys doing it right, like uh, Ginger John. And, oh yeah, yeah, uh, Ginger John. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they are, yeah. But but if but, but if you look at Ginger John and those guys, they, their management practices are A one. I mean, a it, it, it's A one, A one. Yeah. Cool. The uh, the quick on the on the insect. Anything else? Made me think about co planting cover crop and doing natural farming. The amount of insects that you're inviting onto your field was uh, was made, and, and per acre you can get two thousand pounds of insect frass just by having it have cover crop that attracts insects. You can get 2,000 pounds of insect frass per acre just by applying cover crops. So that's like free fertilizer just by doing right practice, you know? And also on the insect tip, you, just like you can have a worm bin. Yeah, the worms, the you worms are amazing. You can have a, a, a fly. soldier fly bin yeah. and therefore be like feeding your chickens and your and, self. And, and, you also, and also a good composter is the millipede. Millipedes, millipedes would make amazing compost, compost stuff. Like millipedes are amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the millipedes. The millipedes are amazing, yeah. Those millipedes are great. Yeah, yeah, those, 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 are, those are the ones, yeah. They used to give USD agriculture loans to, to kill millipedes. Yeah. Oh. oh, good, yeah. That's positive. This is pre-1940, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Money. Yeah. You know? yeah. So all these natural things used yeah. to be of the highest value. You know? Any other questions for John before we wrap it up? So you said the coconut trees don't you get above a thousand feet. Uh, I'd say more closer to the you know, below 400 feet, you start getting some production. Better, and then you got to supplement. I have, the Samoan, I have a Samoan dwarf one, and it's been like five years. Well, you might want to get uh, go get some seawater. Yeah, get some get get five or ten water. gallons of seawater and just throw it on there. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And you, and you don't even have to dilute it. Yeah, you don't. Tree, but you can dilute it in half. And, and, and if you have citrus more. trees that aren't getting really sweet, um, when it's really raining, seawater is is a way way to way to way to push that up. No, one to one to one to well one to ten one thirty. If it's raining a lot, okay, one to ten one to ten one to ten. If it's raining a lot. It actually actually adjusts the pH and the, and the sodium washes out. alkaline. Yeah. Adjusts the pH and, and the sodium and chloride actually are very soluble and they'll wash out. And if you feel like you're having a problem, you can always add a little gypsum calcium sulfate because the calcium sulfate will grab the, the sodium and wa it'll wash right out. So there is a, a cattle ranch on the Hamakua coast and they're having problems with their cattle. So they had Master Cho come out to, uh, to evaluate their situation. When he went out there, he, he just bent down and he pinched some soil and put it in his mouth. And then he looked at the guy and he just said, seawater. <laughs> and the, and the beneficial organisms really respond to all of the mix of the seawater. Sea, yeah. So we can really stimulate biological activity. And in fact, that was a, a, I put an ounce of seawater in every gallon of, of, of uh, filtered water to drink. To, to drink. Yeah. And I had friends that do that, right? And some of them would like, oh, I can't do it. It's the gas. It's horrible because their bodies were so polluted that, it that it just pushed, yeah, it just created problems. And so they said, this is terrible. But if they would have maybe done it for two or three weeks, they would have purged it out some gotten it all figured out. I went up to Mauna Kea. Yeah. Good. Sorry, how much one per gallon? Uh, an, ounce per gallon. an ounce per gallon. When I went up to yeah. Mauna Kea, they, they had coconuts. And I said, oh, are you, are the, is everyone loving the coconuts? And, and, the, and the brother that brought them said, oh, no one wants one. I go, how come? He said, oh, it says it gives everybody, makes them want to go poop. Yeah, which is a good thing. Right, I was hanging <laughs> my head. That, to them, they yeah. didn't want to drink it because it cleansed their body. Right. 
interesting. That's the state of humanity. But anyway, that a coconut's full of salt water, you know, I mean, right. that's mineral water, that's electrolyte water. So it's going to do the same thing. And any anyone that that if you're already so if, to my presentation, like your microbes are going to warrant what you crave, you know. So something that that might be good for you, you might not like the taste of it at first, you know. But that's the uh, the bitter is the healing, you know. And, and the bitter is the better. It'll, it'll, it'll convert. Pretty soon your taste buds will convert. And a lot of people that, that come to me to talk about nutrition, well, at first I say you got to get rid of your McDonald's mouth. And that's, <laughs> that's that monosodium glutamate you mouth, go, you yeah. know? So some children can't, can't even handle fruit because they've had too much monosodium glutamate and all these uh, artificial things in their mouth that the fruit actually feels bad to them, you know? So we need to balance that out, and that's like what we're here for what John's here for today and we're gonna infect with the five percent and we're gonna spread it out there and we're we're the mycelium now the good guys. But you also have to understand that you, when you said that when I was listening to what you're saying I'm going God it even works economically. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that that we need expensive food. We need to grow expensive food and the farmers need to get that money because every dollar a local farmer makes creates ten or twenty ten dollars in the local economy because he spends it locally. And if we had enough of us creating food out of thin air, creating money out of thin air, every dollar we earn will create four dollars worth of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So what do the what, are the what does the mines out there say? Oh wow, we can't let everyone get sovereign. We're going to bring in cheap food. So that sounds really good. Intuitively, that sounds good. It only takes five percent imports, five to ten percent imports of cheap food to drop the price. Mm -hmm. And that puts everybody out of business, or you have to become bigger and better. Interesting. Okay, so that, that's how they do it. They don't have to bring in 50% of the food, doesn't have to be cheap avocados from Mexico. They only have to bring in 5 to 10% of the, wow. to destroy. The, we could have 10,000 acres, 10,000 farms actually, 100,000 acres of avocados in these islands and just to that. satisfy the avocados that are eaten on this island. We could have 10,000 farms right now. It's so, so crazy. Since, since we're all sitting yeah, here, yeah. and there's a lot of money flowing from federal government, other money here, yeah. all kinds of right. Is, is there anybody organizing some kind of loan or company to support farmers or new farmers? You know? No, it's actually probably people working against that. <laughs> because because if you look at because if you look at World War II, what every other poster you saw was victory gardens. Why why aren't they spending $100,000 on posters, victory gardens. It's time for victory gardens. Well, it's time for everybody to do that. Yeah, I agree. But there's people actively working against it. It's interesting this. Once you get a, a group of numbers and people with experience like yourselves, a case can be made and we can be putting up signs for victory gardens. Well, we should. But it's time to make signs and put them up. You know, right now I'm spending four or five hours. Good, let's do it. I'll, I'll help do it. I'm, 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 I'm out weed eating four or five hours a day right now. <laughs> yeah, all it takes is, is... Do it, do it. Tell people one, one excited human... Go, go, go on the internet and look at the Victory Gardens from World War II and, and update them. I think it's actually what you spoke is brilliant. Well, 20 years ago... Signs all over the place, Victory Gardens, like, what's that? Well, one of the things I wanted to do when I, had, when I was doing groups, and at the end we'd be in this situation, it was almost like a... A festival was to organize guerrilla gardeners, right? Which is where, where we would go. We would go to a, a single mother with a kid, and go into her backyard and put up a, a bin with compost and come with sprouts and drop a garden in her backyard. So I wanted to organize guerrilla gardens. Go go to an empty lot, and drop in drop in a pile of compost, plant a garden, and let the community eat it. You know what I mean? So, so, so how do we get to that situation? This is the frustration I see in this COVID thing. I see these trillions of dollars to prop up all of these industries that are suppressing us, that are destroying us. When if they just dropped a trillion dollars on this island, or not even a trillion, a uh, hundred million dollars on this island, we could have gardens everywhere. We could be feeding people everywhere. We would become a tourist mecca. We could, we, everybody could have a little bed and breakfast. Everybody could be there, but no, they're going to give the subsidies to the big corporations that are building their big hotels that are bringing in food from some slave grown horrible that what the avocado what they have done to South America what they have done to South America 
in uh, yeah. the destroying South America for the avocado lust, taking, kicking indigenous people, killing indigenous people, stealing all of their water to grow avocados for California. I mean, it's disgusting. We could have 10,000 acres. We used to fight for this. It was called import substitution. If we just replaced all of the potatoes that are sold, that are fed to our school children with taro, we could have a thousand taro farms right now operating on these islands just to take care of the food that, that the state is buying, this, the potatoes they're buying for all of the industrial applications. It's called import substitution. We could be substituting everything. I used to call it the au pois system or the food shed system. We could be looking at every area. We could drop, break this island into five spots and we could, we could set up a, a, a facility to go, okay, okay, Choice Mart. What are you buying from someplace else that we could grow here? And they could go, hey, we need this, we need this. We, then, then we could come in with the, the stimulus money to put in a farm to grow those things, and we could have food sheds everywhere. Is Island Naturals at least moving in this direction? It's almost impossible to do that because, because these companies need consistency, and they need, they need to know they have exactly the same thing over and over again, and this takes a huge amount of infrastructure. We, they, they've taken five generations to destroy our connection. We don't have an intact culture. We don't have an A to B to C to D. They took out, L, they took out a big chunk of it. We're recreating. I've been, since I was 20, trying to see this happen. I think we're just starting to get to that point. But it, we're all at, I'm at A. How do we get to D, like what you're talking about? Consistency, things, exactly what Logan's doing is amazing. I mean, I, we should have a thousand people here. And we should, be, we should have piles of compost and we should have people that have made all the sprouts. And when people leave, we can fill their truck up with compost and sprouts. And everyone, I, I, my vision is at the end of this kind of thing, we would have trucks and we'd have shredders and we'd have K&F compost being made. And we'd have, like when I went to Thailand, they actually literally, every community had, had big vats. I mean, this is, this is nothing new. They'd have big vats where they would take all their snails and insects that they gleaned from their rice field, throw it in the vat with some molasses and with other stuff, and then the farmers would come, fill up their things and take it and grow their vegetables. Every farmer. And it was like one, and that was where all the fertilizers and the compost were made, and there was a, a team leader that would, would, would cover it. So what it's going to take? It takes cooperation. It takes commodity. It, it yeah. takes right. that. You know, it's, it, it's not just something yeah. like, oh, that sounds like a good idea, yeah. a good business. No, it's this is what you have to do now. Yeah. And so until the system that supports our folly living is no longer here, which we got a couple of glimpses of yeah. recently with Corona, that maybe this system that we're so comfortable with and dependent on might not be around as we know it, as we grew up knowing it, as the grocery store. So, so we're all at A, so we're all at A. So, so right now, all of us need to go plant a garden. All of us need to talk to our neighbor. All of us need to educate ourselves on what glyphosate is. We all have to educate ourselves. We all have to educate ourselves on how to read labels. How to read labels? How do we encourage our neighbors not to feed our kids I I kids horrible stuff? And we start doing it. And 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 right now we're coalescing like little drops of water, right? Now maybe we'll become a, a cup of water, and maybe we one day we'll become a, a pond, and then a lake, and eventually we'll saturate this island. Rain. Eventually, but it's not it's not going to be it's not going to be somebody it's not going to be someone saying I'm going to make a million dollars and I'm going to create a web page and I'm going to do that. No, it takes one garden at a time. It takes one tree at a time. It's you acting every day. Everybody. Every day. Sharing your breadfruit with your neighbor. Uh, uh, growing something and, and turning your mountain apples into a pie and giving it to your neighbor. It, 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 it's all about cooperation. It's all about uh, non-competitive. Remember, uh, competition is anathema. I mean, this whole system, this whole, the whole thing that's happening now is orchestrated by the multi-billionaires to destroy competition. They're destroying, they're using this as social justice because they don't want any competition. The cannabis industry. Yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah, it's all there. I mean, we can look, we can look at the dairy and we can look, look at it, look at it all. So, 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 but, they're, what they, how they look at it is because they're profit mode. We are survival mode. Right. Right. So we're not competing, right. no, we don't. <laughs> but we're also we're we're not socialists. We're not communists. I don't want to own what you own. I don't want you to. I want to. I want to freely share what I have because I have an abundance, 
And, and so, so we've, they, they, they've psychologically set us up for scarcity. Everybody's walking around, I don't have enough money, I don't have this, we're all fighting, oh, I'm not gonna, I gotta have the most pineapples, oh, if I don't, if, I, if my neighbor has pineapples, I'm not gonna be able to sell them to, 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 to which is absolutely ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. It's a time now to begin sharing, have our hearts open, and I'll tell you, you plant that tree, you plant that thing, you start eating, the downloads are gonna come. The queen of the forest, God, whatever you wanna call it, is all about compassion, it's all about love, it's all about really becoming uh, men. Becoming persons, becoming, well, I don't know about human, the human's a, a legal construct. Uh, <laughs> we can go down that rabbit hole if you want. <laughs> yeah. I've had too many rabbit holes. That's why John was here today. So All right. Give a round of applause. Okay. There you go. All right. All right.